Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural ANER Research Symposium. We are so glad to have all of you with us today. And boy, this has been a long time in the coming, in coming so uh, doubly so. Uh, with symposiums and, and this type of thing, it would be so much better if we were all together in person. And uh, we recognize that you know, uh, it's it's difficult to connect with speakers and it's difficult to um, to ask questions and to interact. And so we um, this is this is the best we can do right now. And uh, we hope that we're offering enough opportunities for all of you to engage with each other. And um, and I'll talk about each of those opportunities in just a minute. But I just wanted to say that because we're hoping that this becomes something that we do annually and that next year we can do this in person. So another note I'd like to make is that um, when we started planning this, uh, we reached out to several people to present and almost every single person that we asked to present agreed to, which was good and bad. <laughs> it made it for two very long days and uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today and hopefully tomorrow. Uh, we have a lot of great speakers and a lot of great information and research to share about work around Apalachicola Bay. I wanna first thank all of those speakers and, uh, and all of you, all the participants that are joining us today. I wanna to especially thank the staff for putting together this webinar and specifically uh, uh, the folks that are hosting the folks that are producing, and, uh, and of course, the presenters from the reserve. Uh, one note is that uh, for each of our presenters, uh, they will be made a panelist in the webinar. And after they become a panelist, they can turn on their webcams and they can turn on their audio. And so uh, please be patient as we go through the transitions. Uh, we have several presentations today and tomorrow. So first, a few housekeeping items. Uh, all of the webinar participants are joined uh, muted. And like I said, uh, panelists will be made uh, able to share their, their webcams and their, uh, their audio. When we get to questions, uh, you may either enter the questions into the question box or you may raise your hand, which will be over on the top right of the screen. Once you raise your hand, then uh, Kennedy will take you off mute and you may ask uh, your question uh, over the webinar. Um, today's presentations are all gonna be 15 minutes in length and with about five minutes for questions, if the speaker does not go over. Uh, if they do go over, uh, you're still welcome to put the questions in the, in the uh, question box or if you want, you can go to uh, um, a Padlet, which we've created. I'll ask Kennedy to, to switch the slide over to the Padlet um, with the, the web address. And if you haven't used the Padlet before, it's a really neat way to communicate um, and keep track of uh, uh, interactions between uh, different participants. And everything today on the webinar will be recorded and the question box will be recorded. And of course the Padlet will be recorded and the Padlet will also be live um, through the entire symposium. So if you think of something after today's session ends, uh, you're welcome to go to uh, the Padlet and enter in questions or comments or just, hey, I'd like to learn more about your project and uh, uh, please send me more information. Uh, like I said before, Normally these types of things are an awesome place for people to connect. And uh, we're trying to provide every opportunity possible for all of you to connect with our speakers today. So today's presentations are gonna cover many different subjects. Um, we're gonna highlight coastal processes and mangroves, uh, tropicalization of the reserves, or of the reserve and uh, the Northern Gulf of Mexico. We're gonna talk about estuarine health, primary and secondary productivity, oyster aquaculture, oyster fishery status, 
and uh, finish off the day with a highlight of um, the Apalachicola Bay System Initiative and potential oyster rest restoration in Apalachicola Bay. So we have a full day. Again, very excited for all of you to be here and joining us. And um, I am gonna transition to our keynote speaker of the day. Very pleased to, um, to have um, our national research coordinator, Dr. Chris Kincaid. Uh, Chris is, uh, in, uh, his office in NOAA is the Office for Coastal Management. And the Office for Coastal Management oversees all of the National Estuarine Research Reserves around the country, all 29 of us. And uh, he's gonna give some broad highlights of, um, of what's going on at a national level. And uh, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. And with that, I will let you take it away. Thanks, Jenna, for having me. Keynote sounds like it's so weighty. Um, kickoff, how about that? We'll start us off today, hopefully. Um, I echo Jenna's sentiment in that I wish we were all there in person at the reserve, especially as I'm looking out the window and and uh, expecting six to 12 inches of snow over the next couple of days, just about ready for spring to roll around. And because the reserve is one of the ones that I still haven't gotten to visit yet. So sometime in the near future, um, as soon as possible, we'll be down. I too am really looking forward to um, hearing the next couple of days and diving into the research. As, as Jenna said, I have a national hat Right, uh, looking at all 29, soon to be 30 reserves. So it's great to be able to dig right down into specific research at a specific site. Looking forward to hearing it all. So originally, I think the title of the talk said Introduction of the, the Apalachicola Reserve. And you don't need that. You've all been there. You were all doing the research there. I, I haven't. So really what we're going to do for the next few minutes is just talk about um, the, the national level couple different scales and where research at the reserve here and, and regionally, locally and regionally fits into that national, those national programs. So if we were in person, I would do the, you know, by show of hands, how familiar you are with the reserve system to kind of gauge where this should be. Can't do that too easily. So um, apologies. <laughs> if you get really bored, type questions or comments in the chat box or uh, jokes, even something. Keep yourself busy for the next few minutes. So the the reserve system is a network of 29 protected places right so the 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 base here is our um our system the, the power here is in the system and we'll talk a lot about over the next couple of days about local research and then part of my job is to listen for places where that local research fits into um, regional or national scales where some of those ideas that external and reserve researchers are um, already participating in broader national um, projects and we'll talk about those in just a couple minutes so there we go Yep, um, the reserve. This is a, Appalachian Coal is a fairly large reserve, right? Two hundred and thirty-five thousand acres, give or take, something like that. I think, out of the out of the one point three million total in the system, and and here's our tagline at the bottom. You know, we we have um, protected areas to create resilient estuaries. Everything we do has we're looking at the management applications of this research, and you all know that. I, every every project, every title that I saw over the over the next couple of days is is directly tagged to, to management at either at the state or, or local level. Um, yep, research long-term monitoring, which we'll talk about our system-wide monitoring program in just a minute. But the strength of the system in addition is the networks, the coastal training networks and the outreach and the education K through 12 and K through gray and the land stewardship are really um, set us this system apart from others, from, from um, systems that are just particularly monitoring and having those um, those folks who are helping today support today or get a word out or, or, or provide a training makes the the national Western research resistant or system very different and it's really cool makes it a cool place to work and be involved with all right so there are backbones at all the reserves one we'll talk about in a minute our, our, our monitoring program I just mentioned our, our training and outreach program, the education, every, every um, reserve has an education program, including getting teachers on the estuary, get out there, get in the field when we all can. 
something relatively new. We have our inaugural class of Margaret Davidson Fellows. Kira Allen is the Apalachicola Fellow. I haven't met you yet, Kira, but I'm looking forward to your talk, and especially on hearing uh, the work that you're doing and looking at um, changing salinity regimes and the effects on food webs. I think that's tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, a primary way that we fund a lot of the collaborative research is through uh, money that we let to the University of Michigan, and that goes for our science collaborative. And that we'll talk about that in a minute or two too, but everybody should be aware of, of how that works and um, how to start thinking about projects that, that for potential funding down the road. What one of the things were, that makes the reserve a great place to work and do uh, and do research of all types is this backbone monitoring, right? Water quality, weather, uh, vegetation, biological, especially at Appalachian Coal Reserve, a long-term nectin monitoring that I think Jason's going to talk about. <laughs> And, and those protocols for measuring those things are standardized across the 29. So intercomparable on the water quality and, and, and meteorological stations, right? So, so that standardized instrumentation allows nominally 15 minute data at at least one station telemetered. So near real time access, um, each reserve site. So that uniform, um, consistent, reliable QAQ seed, data is, is the foundation of, of the monitoring system. Where does all that data go? That's a lot, right? We don't want to make sure that stuff's not falling off the table. So if you don't know, now you know. We have a centralized data management office that sits in South Carolina, a really good resource that not only takes our data and makes it available um, in several graphing and export formats, um, but also, you know, the, the, the cell phone app, um, being able to look at real-time data for researchers, but also for educators. For we, we get a lot of hits from from teachers, and lately a lot of homeschoolers and and moms that are downloading full data sets. I want those kids entrained in the system later on because, man, they're 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 cranking. They've got to be doing something fantastic with it all. So, um, also a full suite of web services if you need something for your website somewhere to be able to go grab. But something that researchers should know about, not just for Apalachicola, but for regional or for other 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 studies. Um, I, I realize that I don't have the website on there, but I can always add, add it. Or if you just Google NEARS CDMO, you'll get to it. You'll find it. Um, you don't get too far within the National Western Research Reserve System without hearing the term sentinel sites. Been a little bit of uh, back and forth on what that means, but the way we use it is the concept of the reserves, all the reserves are sentinel sites, and that just means that they have the capacity, we have the capacity for early detection of environmental change in response to natural or anthropogenic stressors, and that allows timely management responses. So, you know, we've done this through specific applications. Um, to look at reserve responses to environmental change, identify opportunities and vulnerabilities, um, and to translate this understanding to coastal communities and coastal managers. So the focus in, up till now has been on, and you can see a, a benchmark there, that round leveling, has been on looking at the effects of changing water levels, sea level rise, on to date mostly emergent vegetation. You can see the bottom right, um, there's a surface elevation table measurement being being made, looking at changes in marsh level, right, over time. And, and Appalachian Coast Reserve has several sets in place. Um, there's a top left image there is of not an Appalachian Coast, but another good leveling going on. So if you want to know what those water levels look like, you need high accuracy, high degree of, of uh, vertical control to know what those small changes in water levels tidally controlled, right, are, are doing to the vegetation community. A new, um, relatively new uh, push for us for our, under our sentinel site umbrella is to start to look a little more comprehensively at submerged aquatic vegetation. We've got robust protocols in place and many reserves have been monitoring SAV like App Appalachicola. Um, here the reserve I think has freshwater brackish and marine species and has some even maybe stops and starts but, but uh, some long-term monitoring of the the, the at least distribution percent cover, um, things like blade length and epiphyte coverage, 
uh, all, all the things that we are going to start looking at a little more holistically as a system and figuring out where we fit as a reserve system into the SAV communities of practice, including within the Gulf of Mexico. There's a strong community of practice there. Another one with SURF, with the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation, Foundation Federation. So, um, you know, we're just kind of figuring out our place in the larger system there and what we have to offer. And Apalachicola Reserve is positioned to help us quite a bit in doing that. Jason, you, you knew that, right? <laughs> um, so, what else do we, what do we do in the system? Well, a lot, right? With 29 very different biogeographic regions or, or systems, we, we measure a lot of stuff and it's as varied as the systems themselves. So, in Rookery Bay and here in Apalachicola, we're looking at mangroves for restoration, for carbon sequestration, um, tropicalization, right? Species distribution. Uh, the, the middle shot is a, a habitat map. I either line cover habitat map at the, at the Apalachicola Reserve. So we're looking at habitat mapping and change and trying to beat that up within the system. Um, there are a lot of citizen science monitoring programs across the, across the nation. The top right there is, is glass, looking at glass eels in the Hudson Bay, which has a strong link to the education department who actually runs that monitoring program. Apalachicola has tons of long nectin trawls and fisheries work. Um, other, so there are several other reserves that do acoustic fish tagging, or there's there's a shot in the lower right here of a tool that the Jacques Cousteau in Reserve in New Jersey um, put together, looking at striper, striped bass migration up the East Coast. Big deal for us here in Massachusetts for knowing when to go get those lines in the water, <laughs> especially in my household. Um, other things like that we're going to talk about here in the reserve that have happened in other places, like looking at carbon fluxes and carbon sequestration, you know, blue carbon um, metrics, measurements, and, and then standards for market uh, analyses. And so that shot at the bottom there is, uh, happens to be in Wilcoit Bay in Massachusetts, but there we have transferred that type of knowledge, measurements, and um, market analyses to other regions like the Gulf in Alaska. A lot to keep track of. So I mentioned the Near Science Collaborative. Uh, it looks like there's some text that's not showing up here, but um, the, the, the point is that we at NOAA puts about $4 million a year uh, let to the University of Michigan. Uh, what did show up in the slide here is um, sort of the, the, the bins that are funded that we look at. And what's important here is that we come, the, the, the not me, I am purposely as the research lead, purposely sort of um, separated in a separation of church and state from the way that the, the collaborative projects are funded. But the science collaborative, the University of Michigan folks, go ahead and ask the reserves, the whole system, what are your local needs? What are the management priorities that you're seeing so that we can go out and write our request for proposals out directly to address those? Right, so the reserves are required to be one of the collaborators and the primary collaborator, but they're also required to have specific end users and specific end points and management um, tasks that they're going after. So a really, and, and we're, we're really getting some great projects funded. Oh, there it is. Maybe I just, I, I, I uh, <laughs> maybe I animated by accident, apologies. Oh, I, I really did. Hmm. That's what happens when you steal a slide from somewhere else and just stick it in. <laughs> okay, so what else is going on in terms of projects um, that scale up here that um, Apalachicola Reserve is involved in, at least in some way? Um, there have been projects uh, looking at genomics and environmental DNA, presence of abs and absence of species. And so um, just looking at quickly at the Apalachicola results, they're, they're one of six reserves initially that started looking for um, different species. Uh, Pacific Northwest wanted to look at salmonid species. Hudson wanted to look at eels, um, but the, the range of um, native and maybe some surprising uh, genomes that came back in terms of species presence uh, both amphibians, reptiles, and, and fish that came back at the reserve was pretty, was, was interesting to me. And, and some that, you know, that got, uh, yep, native, native, expected, expected, and some that you say, hmm, well, we'll have to go back and take another look at that. Really great projects that are going on, and we're just starting off with that. 
there's a new project that is looking at um, historical tea sheets and looking at what losses have been uh, uh, sedimentary and, and geoform losses have gone on in reserves, in several reserves, I think maybe a dozen around the system. And, and really the target there is to look at what's worth restoring. What do we want to look at considering thin layer placement? What's going to subside and maybe uh, be subject to inundation so much so that we don't want to put any money there? There is uh, up to the top left here, a project that NASA is funding through the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center that's looking at salinity gradients and methane production, eventually to get at mapping all the coastal wetlands in the United States, um, at least continental United States, for, for better numbers on carbon sequestration with salinity. Cool projects. Uh, there is a new three-year project that, the that Apalachicola is involved along with about uh, 15 or 18 reserves that's looking at multiple scales across tidal marshes up throughout the nation and direct climate impacts and how we compare some of the numbers that we've been measuring um, and the the vegetation monitoring that we've been doing even if we're doing it we've been doing it slightly differently in the past across regions. I, I need to give a quick shout out to my colleagues, my National Ocean Service colleagues at the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science. They've been doing a, a lot of projects with various reserves, including Apalachicola, and sometimes it's fisheries, sometimes it's benthic mapping, sometimes it's um, uh, carbon fluxes. So just just keep it up, and uh, NCOS, glad to see you here with us and glad to continue to work with you. All right. How am I doing on time? Uh, you know, I am really stoked. I said this already, but really excited to hear these talks today. It's really great to be able to dive in. Um, I know that the the breadth of research, just looking through the titles, matches up with what we want to do nationally, what we want to do as a system, uh, and looking forward to hearing what, not only this round of research, but what's next. You know, part of my job is to hear what are the, the future collaborations? What's wh What do we want to highlight? What do we want to have the Apalachicola RC and staff bring to a national level or as a capability that we can reach back in? So I really appreciate you all being here virtually and I appreciate you letting me come in and crash and listen to them all. And I'm sure I'll have lots of questions over the next couple of days. But as long as we have time, Jenna, um, I can take a couple of questions now. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, what a great overview. And uh, thank you for your energy this this early in the day when there's like an impending snowstorm coming and everything's going uh, going on. I know down here it's uh, we're supposed to get some some bad rainstorms. So um, yes, yeah, that has been the the interesting topic of the week. Uh, I see one yeah. question in in the the question box, and um, I'll invite any of the participants to either add questions there. Or if you raise your hand, uh, we will take you off mute and we'll call on you to ask your question. So uh, the, the question in the question box is from Michael Martinez Colon. And he asks, how do you account for storms when it comes to making measurements at the Sentinel sites? Mm -hmm. Great, great question. Um, well, the, this Apalachicola in particular has had some issues with equipment being damaged by storms. Um, in fact, we as a, uh, are talking with engineers at the Naval Academy, students as part of their capstone projects, to redesign some pilings and, and piers and hardened structures to withstand hurricanes, basically, or other large storms coming through. Apalachicola already did that, so they've got lessons to teach us and the and share with the the, the students. So always something that we you know you'd like to have instrumentation in place to be able to measure the effects whether that's wave run up whether that's increased precip whether that's looking at um, any changes pre post and, and during a storm um, we are trying to harden our our infrastructure as much as possible so that we can continue to make those measurements but it does happen especially in places that get pounded by uh, increasing frequency of hurricanes yeah, that's a great question the cool thing is when you do get to keep the instrument in place, you can go to the centralized data management office and pull out really great looking time series where barometric pressure falls off or rain, you know, precip blows up and salinity changes and just really cool wind speeds changing. Yeah, I was just going to note that we had mixed results after Hurricane Michael in 2018. And, and of course, we, we lost some instrument instrumentation, but um, one of the cool um, 
uh, data sets is from our station that is up up the river just a little bit and uh, we saw the salinity wedge come up the river and then that followed with um, uh, hypoxic conditions and we had a massive fish kill immediately after so it was really neat to, to follow that story and it's just one of many and we do a lot oh. of trying to capture those applications and those specific stories too to to, to share mm -hmm. yeah go ahead jenna was there another one i don't know if i have time or not i'm sorry yeah so the web webinar software this question's popping up so uh a question from josh brighthop is uh chris mentioned a soon to be added 30th site 30th NER. where is that going to be yes connecticut is fairly far along in the designation process it takes a couple of years from a letter of interest from a state governor to actually designation of the reserve so connecticut is coming along they've they've chosen um sites and they are having their public meeting including one tomorrow afternoon actually to talk about research and monitoring for for the public in connecticut um two new in addition two new letters of interest so very early in the process from um, green bay wisconsin and louisiana that hole in the map along the gulf coast that's all of louisiana maybe in the next few years we'll get uh we'll get filled in Yes, we would love to have another NER in the Gulf. Great compliment. Okay, there's another question uh, that says, hi, I realized that the water quality stations were set at three meters above the sediment surface. However, during the long, long time monitoring, did you modify the height of the sensor to adjust for sediment vertical change? So um, that's gonna be a question for Jay probably, but um, specifically on this one nominally there it, it, there unless there was something major that happened in that sediment interface um we try and uh keep a swamp station at the same place for as long as possible i'm not quite sure the details there i i, I um, defer to the local knowledge yeah so um i'll just say real quick that uh, all of our sites uh whether it's water quality monitoring or the sediment, the surface elevation tables, um, are surveyed uh, to a, a pretty uh, exact elevation. Um, some of them are millimeter, um, um, can, uh, what's the right word? Um, uh, accuracy. accuracy. Thank you. I gotta wake up. Sorry. <laughs> and um, and so all of those are surveyed. And and if we do have storm effects and we we do have some impacts to the monitoring stations, then um, once they're put back in, we do resurvey them to ensure that uh, we we have that elevation change and it's it's documented in the metadata. And, and that's where I put a plug in for another part of NOAA and, and the Ocean Service, and that's the National Geodetic Survey, who's helped quite a bit in raising um, re research reserve system capabilities in doing that that high resolution vertical control, making sure we know where we are in a title or, or geodetic datum. Mm -hmm. I don't see any other questions. Um, I don't know if there's anybody that has their hand raised. If not, I will just say another big, big thank you to Chris. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me, Jenna. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this symposium being a model for a lot of other reserves around the system to dig in and get all their research, their uh, external researchers and internal together. It's a great, it's a great model. Thanks for being a, a pioneer and figuring out a lot of the hiccups. Well. Um, you know we have we have some great examples the the gtm reserve uh, has has done this for a few years and uh, they're doing their first virtual symposium next week and uh but sure yes we will try to work out all of the kinks <laughs> as we go and i appreciate everyone's patience in this very much so again thanks chris and uh, enjoy and uh thank you for being part of our symposium so we're going to kick off the presentations and our first speaker uh, this morning will be Caitlin Snyder from here at the reserve and the title of Caitlin's talk is mangroves near a rapidly changing range limit in Apalachicola Bay so hopefully Kate will come on in just a second and so you can see her and and uh, and hear her oh there she is now Good morning. take it away Kate good morning um, 
Yes, I'm Kate Snyder and I'm Stewardship Coordinator at the Apalachicola Reserve and I'm happy to kick off the presentations for our first ever virtual symposium. I work mostly in uplands management, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about wetlands and our mangrove mapping efforts um, of the recent years. So when I first started mapping mangroves over seven years ago, I don't think I understood the consequences of doing so or the consequences of these mangroves moving into our marshes here. Climate change is altering species distributions worldwide, including those of cold sensitive tropical species. Tropicalization is impacting both human and natural communities in a variety of ways. Therefore, there's a pressing and current need to map and monitor these species shifts not only for rare or imperiled species, but common and keystone species like mangroves. One such changing front here is an Apalachicola. We generally have three species of mangrove in Florida, red, black, and white. Trying to advance the slides here. There we go. And these three species occupy much of the coastal wetlands of peninsular Florida. Cedar Key is generally recognized as the northernmost limit and along the Gulf Coast of Florida. However, mangroves have been found historically and recently north of Cedar Key. We know migration and expansion of mangroves is happening on several fronts, including along the Atlantic coast and the coastlines of Louisiana and Texas. Despite this ecologically important region, mangroves have never been extensively mapped or monitored here. So we address these gaps in knowledge by asking four questions. How long have mangroves been present in the Apalachicola area? Within the past century, when have freeze events occurred that could have resulted in mangrove mortality? What is the current distribution and structure of mangroves? And how has the recent frequency of freeze events potentially influenced the spatial distribution of red and black mangrove species? To answer these questions, we combine ground surveys, historical records, and analyses of past climate data. In 2018 and 19, we surveyed all, almost all potential habitat in Franklin and Gulf counties. We did this by boat, kayak, and foot. And for every mangrove that we found, we marked its location, its species, its height, its reproductive status, and what kind of habitat it was in. To see when mangroves were first documented north of Cedar Key and how many, what they looked like, we searched herbarium databases and literature. For climate data, we accessed historical and recent station-based data sets, as well as recent gridded data set from the PRISM Climate Group. This unique spatial data set is four kilometer squared cells, which represented in our study, the number of leaf damage and mortality events over a 30 year period. We took local data on plant and crown height to generate species specific allometric equations for local populations. These were then used to create plant canopy area, total coverage and abundance for the study area using polygon and point data from the field. To see if 30 years of freeze events have shaped the distribution of mangroves, we perform re regression analyses looking at mortality and leaf damage events with mangrove area, percent of wetland mangrove, and number of individuals. Finally, we created risk maps to illustrate potential mangrove damage. As I mentioned, Cedar Key has generally been recognized as the northernmost limit for mangroves along the Gulf of Florida, which is letter I on this map. Indeed, our earliest records revealed that in 1876 there were herbarium specimens for Cedar Key, and even earlier in naturalist writings from about 1850. But only in the mid-20th century were mangroves first starting to be documented north of Cedar Key along the northern Gulf. Black mangrove was first documented on Dog Island in 1941, letter F, and red mangrove was documented on Clockney Bay in 1955, around letter G. After 1980, there was a more increased documentation of mangroves due to increase in botanical research. As you can see, mangroves have been here historically in the Northern Gulf, but individuals were often small in size, scattered, and had notes of freeze damage or death in the specimen details. When we look at freeze events in the last century from about 1931, we can see a lot of climate variability, which is usually the case with climate data. But if you focus in on the last 30 years in recent history, we can see 17 events where mangroves could have experienced leaf damage by reaching thresholds below negative 4.2 degrees Celsius, or the dashed line on the graph. 
In those same 30 years, there have been seven events that could have induced mangrove mortality, or below negative 6.6 .6 degrees in the solid gray line on the graph. We assumed that red and black thresholds were similar because field thresholds have not been established for red mangroves yet. The recent mortality years include 1989, 96, 2000, 2003, and most recently 2010. 1985 and 89 were the most severe at almost negative 13 degrees Celsius and negative 10. But in the last decade or more, there have been few events that would have contracted mangroves in this region but rather there's been a climate more favorable for mangrove expansion. So we found mangroves everywhere. They occupied the bay sides of Cape and Barrier Island systems of St. Joseph Bay, Apalachicola Bay, all the way to Dog Island and Alligator Harbor. Mangroves inhabited a diversity of substrates, elevations, and coastal wetland habitat types. But they were generally occupied in protected areas, low energy shorelines with marsh, and in moderate to high salinities, as one could expect. No, this is not like South Florida yet, as less than 0.1% of the total wetland area is currently mangroves. Most of the mangroves in this region are black mangroves, but as you can see on this map, red has a broad and strong foothold in this region. So what do mangroves look like here in Apalachicola? We estimated about 98% of the mangroves are black mangrove, and if you squish them all together, this is about 21 acres and over 64,000 individuals. We estimated red mangroves make up about 2% at about half an acre in total, and we marked over 3,500 individuals. So much for not having mangroves north of Cedar Key. Both species reached over three meters in height, but tended to average just under one meter. So these mangroves here are small in size compared to our South Florida forests. This is a map of Pilot's Cove, one of my favorite sites, on Little St. George Island at the apex of Apalachicola Bay. Here you can see the complexity of the habitat in an area where both red and black are abundant. We often mark black mangroves in the field as polygons because they were found in dense clusters or areas, and we couldn't tell one individual from another. They occupied oyster spits, salt, salt pans, and the low high marsh ecotone. Red mangroves, on the other hand, were usually standalone. We marked them as points in the field. They occupied tidal pool fringes, tidal creeks, marsh edges, interior, and islands. Here's an example of another habitat where mangroves have encroached. This is in Goose Island in St. George Island State Park. And here, red mangroves have found a happy home in the low marsh, marsh of Spartina. And lastly, here's an example from the east end of Dog Island, where you remember where the first black mangrove was documented in Franklin County in 1941. Here there are extensive areas of black dwarf mangroves occupying salt pan habitat. Only recently have red mangroves moved into this area and intermixed with the black mangroves. There we go. So this graph shows the relationships between the number of potential leaf damage events on the x-axis and dependent variables for each species, red and black mangrove. We predicted that the higher frequency of freeze events would result in reduced mangrove occurrence and distribution. And this was supported for red mangrove, where we found strong negative relationships between number of leaf damage events and coverage and abundance. This wasn't exactly the case for black mangroves, which leads us to believe that they're uh, true to their nature, they're very cold tolerant, or there may be other variables at play that could have resulted in some of those outliers, including habitat. We did the same analysis for mortality events, but we ended up not finding any mangroves in the prism grid cells that had more than three freeze events. Oh, there we go. To help visualize freeze damage risk, here are heat maps for the study area for each species. These illustrate that the closer to the warm Gulf waters you get, the less risk there is for freeze damage. Extreme temperatures are moderated across the Cape and Barrier Island systems, where mangroves here have found a refuge in order to establish and survive. These graphs also show the difference between the two species, black on top and red on the bottom. Black is more cold tolerant and less sensitive to risk, and therefore can occupy more of the coastal habitats where red mangrove is more restricted, even along our, our very coastlines. 
Note that this map is only showing the risk damage as it relates to recurring minimum temperatures over time. Other variables can impact whether any given mangrove can experience mortality on a freeze event, including microclimate and habitat, mangrove height and density, as well as tide and wind on any given cold front. Okay, so I hope by now that you're with me in saying that our work extends the range limits of mangroves along the northeastern Gulf of Mexico above Cedar Key in terms of distribution coverage and abundance. Our synthesis also points to rapid and recent expansion of mangroves. Mangroves have been present in history here, but have likely contracted and expanded over time. And we appear to be in a recent expansion period, which we have every reason to believe can continue. Long-term freeze events and land ocean gradients have shaped Apalachicola Bay mangroves, as well as probably mangroves at other range limits along with the other variables. Mangroves are not only surviving, but reaching heights, densities, and reproductive stages not yet documented here before. Not only do we have black mangroves, the more cold tolerant species, but red mangroves, which is unique for this range limit. Reasons for this probably warrant further investigation into things like propagule dispersal pathways and microclimate and habitat variables impacting red mangroves. Local recruitment is occurring for both species. Both black and red mangroves are happily flowering and fruiting at different times of the year and at many different sites. This is not only contributing to what we see today, but of course will in influence what we see in the future as far as distribution and structure. So the increasing establishment and survivorship of mangroves could indicate tropicalization of more temperate coastal ecosystems. Historically, severe cold fronts have come across the panhandle and killed back mangroves over time and sustained our salt marsh dominance. However, recent reduction in the number, intensity, and duration of these freeze events has allowed to make mangroves to survive and encroach in new areas. I like to call this the three steps forward, one step back in recent winters. But this is not a unidirectional trend, of course, by any means, because there's a lot of different variables that could impact mangrove populations here. These include like climate variability and extremes. I think we just had snow in Louisiana. Sea level rise and impact of future storm intensity. Depredation of propagules and herbivory of the trees themselves, as well as inter interspecific competition in our marsh species. Nevertheless, mangrove migration and expansion here will have significant local impacts. Other cold sensitive or mangrove affiliate species could move in sync with mangroves. For example, common snook, a mangrove associate, was once rare in the Big Bend region and has now been on the rise since 2007 and may even be locally reproducing in the region. Birds, fish, crustaceans, and exotic plants like Brazilian pepper could shift with warming temperatures and mangrove habitat. I'm on the lookout for Brazilian pepper. For larger processes, we've yet to grasp the details of what this marsh mangrove shift could mean here. Things like carbon storage, biodiversity, and the big one, resiliency. But we hope this work contributes to the understanding of species shifts and tropicalization in the context of climate change, at least on one front. And so with that, uh, I'd like to thank, of course, Ainer for support and funding for this, and my co-authors, co Laura, Mike, Chris, Randall, and Karen, who without, I would not have gotten this tremendously large data set together, hopefully towards a paper which you can look out for this year. So with that, I guess I'll try to field some questions if there's still time left. Yeah, Kate, um, I have one. We have uh, Jacob Gaddy has his hand up. I'm going to unmute him. Um, and maybe he can ask you. Yeah, I I don't believe I meant to put my hand up. I'm sorry about that. Oh, okay, no problem. Um, okay, we have uh, one from Lynn Wilder in the chat. Um, are the benefits of mangroves reducing coastal erosion from hurricane events being considered? Yeah, there's a lot we don't know about the, the rate of sea level rise and erosion from big storms like that and what that means for resiliency in either the mangroves that are here or using them for restoration in the future. Um, mangroves can support um, coastal resiliency and keep the shoreline from erosion, but I think there's just a lot that we don't know at this range limit. Great, thank you. 
Um, and then we have a hand raised from Josh Breithaupt. Hey, Josh. Okay. Hey, Kate, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. That was that was an awesome talk. I'm really excited to see your data set. Um, lots of questions that it'll be fun to follow up with later. But one question I had um, that, you know, the landward margin, there, there's so few of them, but you did show a few locations where there are, like I saw one near Carabelle and maybe one near St. Vincent. Um, I guess, what was what was the criteria for being present there? Did you just need to see like a propagule that was rooted? Was there a certain structural size it had to reach or, or what, what criteria did you use for that? Yeah, we marked any mangrove, um, not propagule, but established seeding or, or tree that we found. So the one on St. Vincent on the Gulf side was actually a very small seedling that is not there anymore. And the one at the Caribou boat ramp is an established black mangrove in the riprap there. Um, so we didn't look at mangroves, uh, sorry, propagules, but rather just where they were established. I guess a follow-up question that is kind of interesting is just thinking about, I was struck by your pilot's cove picture too, that how many, you know, it's, it's there, how many reds are on the interior and, and the blacks are fringing, which is totally backwards to the, you know, the old thing we used to talk about where they were zoned. And we know that's not really true anymore, but I was struck by how striking that difference is. And so I'd be curious if you have thoughts just on, you know, sort of what's driving their dispersal or where they're at other than temperature around the area at this point. Yeah, yeah. So we think temperature is a primary dri driver with whether they survive, but establishment is a, a different question of looking at some of those propagule dispersal pathways. And I'm not sure if the reds are just finding it better to land on those slower moving waters that are more protected, more sheltered, and the black mangroves are just able to withstand the edges on those oyster spits and salt pans. But yeah, I like to show that that map because it's such an interesting and complex site. Um, and a lot of these mangroves are occurring on the bay sides of the islands where historically hurricanes have pushed over the islands and created this really diverse habitat of sloughs and creeks and oyster spits. So the elevations are everywhere there. So it would, it would just take probably more looking into uh, the establishment processes for both species here. Interesting. Well, thanks so much, I appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Okay, Kate, um, we still have a little bit more time left. So I just got a uh, question in the box. Um, was it checked out where the origin of the mangroves are if they were transferred with storms? Yeah, there's been a few researchers, uh, grad students over time looking into the genetics and uh, offhand, I don't know the details of that, but propagules do circulate in the Gulf and hurricanes are one of those vectors that help disperse them. Uh, in different directions, whether from the west or the east. Um, so genetically, they're they're probably from Florida and Caribbean populations, but um, locally, I don't know if they're getting more uh, specific into their own, um, you know, group here or, um, yeah, I have to look into the details of that. Okay, great. Um, that is all I am seeing popping up. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Kate, so much for that great presentation. And uh, we're going to transition to the next talk. Is and I appreciate everyone's uh, patience with the the presentation. Um, yes, this is very interesting. Controlling from. East Point across the nation and across the building. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Michael Oslin, and he is from the, um, he's a research ecologist at the USGS Wetland and Aquatic Research Center. And his talk today will be winter climate change and the tropicalization of coastal ecosystems. So, hey Mike, I see you. Welcome to the symposium. Take it away. Hello? Yeah, we can hear yes. you loud. Okay, sorry about that. It wasn't, I was, I could hear um, from my headphones originally. Okay, well, let me know if there's an echo because it, it's going through the laptop. So, so hello, thanks so much for the invitation. My name is Mike Osland and I am a research ecologist at the 
um, USGS Wetland and Aquatic Research Center in Lafayette, Louisiana. And I'm going to um, follow up with the, the same theme that Caitlin just spoke about. And thanks so much for the invitation. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about winter climate change and the tropicalization of coastal ecosystems. Okay, I'll just say next slide because it doesn't look like I have control. All right, so I've got I've got two objectives to this talk. The first is to place the Apalachicola mangrove range expansion in a global and regional perspective, and so that's going to be the first half or so. And then the second is to show that mangroves are um, part of this much larger process of tropicalization. So this figure shows the different coastal wetland transition zones across the globe. So these are different um, mangrove range limits. And so the dark green in this figure, okay, um, if you go back one, please. I think it, it may be auto advancing. Okay, so this map shows um, different climate controlled coastal wetland transition zones across the globe. And the important one to pay attention to are the ovals in red. And so those are areas where, where winter temperatures control the, the mangrove, the poleward mangrove range limits. And those are located in South America and Brazil, in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and China. And then, as you just heard, the Southeast and the Apalachicola region is a globally important uh, range limit for mangroves and it's an area that's extremely sensitive to to climate change so mangrove replacement of salt marshes next slide please okay so since the 1980s mangroves have been expanded along the northern gulf of mexico and atlantic coasts um, roughly in these locations i've used the stars to highlight some hot spots um, so you uh, back one, please. So we've got the Apalachicola area, which is a, a very important hotspot. Louisiana, um, Texas near Galveston, and all the way down through to South Texas. Uh, Port Rancis is a hotspot, which is another NUR. Um, and on the Atlantic coast near St. Augustine, near the GTM NUR. So there are three NURs in the southeast that have mangrove expansion, um, the GTM, Apalachicola, and then also, also the Mission Rancis. And then also near Cedar Key. Next slide, please. And so here's another map that shows, back one, please. Here's another map that shows the distribution of specific species. So we've got the three species, Avicennia, which is the black square, Rhizophora, which is the red mangrove, which is the, the the white circle, and then the stars with nuclear rexamosa. And um, I included this just to reinforce that the Apalachicola nur is really, really interesting in that you've got this mixture of Rhizophora and Avicennia, the red and black mangroves. That's very, very different than our mangrove range limits in Louisiana and Texas, which are dominated primarily by the black mangrove, Avicennia. So the Apalachicola Nur is, is really, really unique in that regard. Um, and then the height of the, the mangroves in Apalachicola are much taller than in Texas and Louisiana as well. Okay, next slide, please. So here's a, a table that shows um, the historical records of mangrove presence in Louisiana. And so this is a key question. How long have mangroves been present along the Gulf Coast? And in Louisiana, they've been present for, for quite a while, going all the way back to some of the first natural historians to write about ecosystems in Louisiana. And so this is a table from a recent paper that shows these different references. Um, and some of them are really interesting. Um, in 1915, there's a video of Teddy Roosevelt visiting um, some of the Bear Islands in Louisiana with mangroves in the background. Okay, next slide, please. So a key question has been, well, what's the effect of these extreme freeze events like the one we're getting, we've had this week in Louisiana and Texas on the distribution of mangroves? And so here's a figure that shows the threshold that results in um, mangrove mortality in this case, and the different freeze events going all the way back to 1890. And a key, key oval to pay attention to here are the freeze events in the 1980s. The 1980s, that was a really important decade for tropical species across the Gulf and mangroves specifically. Um, 
those type of events resulted in mass mortality. So since then, we've had man we've had a almost 30 years of mangrove expansion in many of these ecotones. Um, and the Apalachicola area is one of those areas that where mangroves have benefited from this, the absence of these freeze events. Next slide, please. And so we use that information to, to evaluate the expansion and contraction of mangroves in Louisiana. And here is a figure that shows that. So we've got mangrove area on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. And so the coverage today is we expect is larger than it has been in the past, but over the past century, these, there's been these um, expansion and contraction phases. Next slide, please. Okay, so we know that winter climate is a, is a very important driver of salt marsh mangrove forest interactions in the southeast. And here's a map that shows where mangrove forests are present in black. And this now this would be revised and the Apalachicola region would be in, in black as well. Um, next. And so the question is, will change in winter temperature extremes lead to the poleward mangrove migration at the expense of salt marshes? Can mangroves sp spread into those coastal wetlands that are currently dominated by salt marshes? Next. And so an important part of that question is to identify the tipping points for mangrove range expansion. So those are the temperatures that control this transition from salt marsh to mangrove. And this slide shows the tipping point. And so this is from uh, next. Okay, so this slide shows um, one example of the temperature threshold that separates salt marshes from mangrove forests. And so it's a really pretty sigmoidal relationship. Um, on the y-axis, we have the percentage of coastal wetlands dominated by mangrove forests from zero to 100%. Um, back, please. And then on the x-axis, we have temperature. And so it shows that that transition occurs right around negative seven degrees C. And, um, and this has been updated with recent data following the 2018 freeze to show, to differentiate between leaf damage and then also mortality. So leaf damage occurs closer to negative four, as Caitlin talked about, and then mortality occurs somewhere between negative six and negative seven. And the events that we experienced this week in Texas and Louisiana are very close to that threshold. So it'll be interesting to see the extent of leaf damage and mortality in Texas and Louisiana. Next. Okay, so I included this map to show um, that there are these areas that are uh, especially sensitive to mangrove range expansion. And so the colors show the, pers the temperature increase that would be required to for mangrove dominance to occur. Zero two is red, the peach is two to four. And um, if you pay attention to the Apalachicola NUR there, as well as the Mishnariensis NUR and the GTM NUR, they're all located in these hot spots of expansion. And the Apalachicola and it's in part due to the fact that it juts out into the Gulf of Mexico. And during these freeze events, the Gulf of Mexico is warm. And so those warm waters buffer the Apalachicola and Nur from these freeze events. And so that's why it's a hot spot. Next. And here's an older figure. Um, this one is actually, it's from 2013. Um, showing the predicted future mangrove presence and abundance between 2070 and 2100 under a lower greenhouse gas scenario on the left, a higher greenhouse gas scenario on the right, and then the upper panel show mangrove presence, and then the lower panel show mangrove abundance. And the, the take home here is, is really to pay attention to the Apalachicola area. Um, it's really a hot spot um, in these results um, as an area that's that's highly sensitive and vulnerable to mangrove range expansion. And that goes on, that goes much beyond mangroves. It extends to other species as well. And I'm going to talk more about that in the second part of this presentation next. So the second objective is to show that mangroves are just one example of the tropicalization of coastal ecosystems. Uh, next. And I'm going to be talking about a paper that just got accepted this week. Um, the title is Tropicalization of Temperate Ecosystems in North America, the Northward Range Expansion of Tropical Organisms in Response to Warm and Winters. And it includes a long list of, of collaborators, Phil Stevens, Meg Lamont, who is also presenting in this NUR symposium. She does a lot of work in that area. 
and she wrote a section on sea turtles. Um, Rick Bruska, Kristen Hart, Hart Harding Waddell, KB Langton, Caroline Williams, Barry Kime, Adam Tarando, Eric Ryer, Katie Marshall, Michael Loic, Ross Busick, Amanda Lewis, and Jeff Seminoff. And this, this review includes sections on all sorts of different organisms and ecosystems across the continent. Um, and it, it emphasizes the, the, um, the role of winters in controlling the northern range limits of tropical cold sensitive species in the tropical temperate transition zone. Next, please. And it's been accepted to global change biology. So here's a map that, that roughly sums up that paper. So this map shows the tropical temperate transition zones across North America. And then those photos show um, different species that are whose northern range limits are controlled by these extreme cold events. And um, they, the, it covers amphibians, reptiles, manatee, coastal fishes, insects, terrestrial plants, and coastal wetland plants. Next, please. And here's a figure that shows why, um, why those extreme events are so important. So the blue here is number of years, and the red is the return interval. And on the x-axis, we have minimum annual temperature from negative 8 to 6 degrees C. And, and what this shows, that this is, I mean, everybody who lives in the, around the Gulf knows this. Most of our winters are fairly warm, and that, that's shown by that peak blue. Um, but every now and then we get a winter that's extreme and crosses that threshold zone, which is shown in gray, which is the threshold for cold damage and mortality. And so those events occur once every 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, next. And those events control the northern range limits of terrestrial coastal wetland plants. So these are different sections in the review that I'm going to quickly highlight. Uh, terrestrial coastal wetland plants, some good examples of that, that are the saguaro cactus in the Sonoran Desert. Um, there's a, a lot of really cool examples from the Sonoran Desert in this review that were written by Rick Bruska. Uh, mangroves, have, as we've heard about. Next. Coastal fishes. Some really good examples of that of fishes are snook and cobia, and snook, snook have been expanding in, in that area, especially around Cedar Key um, recently. Next, I think the next slide is sea turtles, and here's a photo of Megalomont's group in St. Joe. And with this recent event, there's a cold stunning event in South Padre Island that's occurring right now, and there's an NPR article today about it. Next, please. Reptiles like the Burmese python. Next. Amphibians like the Cuban tree frog, which um, can move in ornamental tropical plant shipments, and it's been found in New Orleans near the Audubon Zoo. Next. Manatees. Next. And insects. Um, and here's an example of, of a mosquito, the Aedes aegypti. So all of these different organisms are really good examples of tropical cold sensitive species whose northern range limits are controlled by extreme cold events and there are organisms that could move northward in response to warm and winters. And so here's another the figure that I showed at the beginning to sum this up. Next. And here's a, another figure to show where those species may move under alternative future climate scenarios. So here's the northward position of climatic zones under alternative future scenarios. There's the recent on top, a plus two, a plus four, and a plus six. And um, uh, what you can pay attention to here is the movement of those yellows and reds northward. Um, and you could envision that there are species that will be able to respond to that northward shift and expand their range limits accordingly if they're able to disperse into those areas and become established. All right, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer questions. All right, Mike, yeah, we do have a question in the question box. Um, Renee Colini asks, uh, one thing that we've heard is that in addition to warmer winters, we can still expect more extreme events like winter storms uh, in the majority of Texas, Louisiana and um, Mississippi was experiencing this week. 
over time, would you expect mangroves to become more robust to these freeze events overall uh, when the habitat is more suitable temperature-wise? Yeah, that's a great question. So by the end of the century, the expectation is that those events will be much warmer. So an extreme event in at the end of the century will be much warmer than today. However, over the next couple of decades, there's a there's um there's some well, so the Arctic is warming, and the climate scientists are um, making the establishing and investigating the linkage between fluctuations in the jet stream and these outbreaks of cold air like we have today. And so at their northern range limit, mangroves um, are very, very resilient. They have adaptations that make them resilient to freeze events, especially the Abyssinia, the black mangrove, and that they can be frozen to the ground and then um, and re-sprout. And so that's one of the adaptations that they have to extreme freeze events. Yeah, and this, this event in, that occurred this week will be especially interesting. So I suspect in Louisiana and Texas that there will be some mortality and also some, some damage. Um, the black mangrove is unique that it re-sprouts. It actually will send up new, new, um, new stems from the base when it's damaged. Okay, any other questions, Josh? It looks like Josh Breithaupt uh, has his hand up. Um, let me double check. All right, you are able to unmute yourself, Josh, if you still have a question. Okay, I do, yeah, thank you. Uh, Mike, it's a lovely talk. I appreciate seeing uh, just the, the broad scale picture there. One thing I, it struck me, is, has anybody looked yet at the, the freeze tolerance of the white mangrove? Yeah, hey Josh, good to hear. Good to hear from you. Um, no, so the primary focus has been on Avicennia, and there's been quite a bit bit of work done on the black mangrove um, across the Gulf of Mexico and in the Atlantic. Um, there's still a lot more that, that could be done on the black mangrove, but with regards to Rhizophora and Lagoon Filaria, they've received much less attention. And that's in part due to the fact that they're not at the northern range limits in, in Louisiana and Texas. Um, there's been a little bit of work done in South Florida, but no, that's a, that's a really important area of, of research. Um, and there's a need for, for more physiologically based studies on rhizophora in, in the Google area. All right, thanks. We got a follow-up question from Renee. Um, from a restoration perspective, should specialists who are working on restoration in the Northern Gulf begin to consider integrating mangroves preemptively? Uh, related, can mangroves adapt any better or worse to rising sea levels than salt marshes? Ooh, that's a good, excellent question, Renee. Um, and that's, that's a, a lot of people view mangrove restoration as a potential silver bullet. The data so that, so far, show, I mean, Louisiana, there was a study that compared the ability of mangroves and marshes to adapt to sea level rise, and their rates of change were very similar. Now, so, so that's one, one line of evidence that indicates that there may not be a benefit, but there's still a need for, there's only a few studies that have investigated that. Now, in, in terms of planting mangroves beyond their range limit, there's a risk there, a very, very big risk. If you plant mangroves and they have, say, a decade to become established and become dominant and replace the marsh, if there is a freeze event, the mangroves could be killed and you could get peak collapse and the conversion of that wetland to open water. So from a, a personal perspective, I think it makes much more sense to plant salt marshes near these range limits and allow the mangroves to recruit naturally rather than planting mangroves beyond the range limit. And there's a really nice paper by Aaron Macy from the Dauphin Island Sea Lab on this topic that I think just got accepted to restoration ecology yesterday. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and that is all that we have currently. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thanks for the invitation to present. Thanks, Mike, so much. And just a reminder to everybody, uh, the questions box is at the, the bottom right of your screen, hopefully. And uh, please feel free to enter questions there as you would like. And um, 
Josh, come back on, on camera. You're up next. <laughs> so I'm very uh, pleased to. Yes, sir. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to introduce Dr. Josh Breithup from FSU. And today um, he'll be presenting on uh, relating carbon to organic matter in mangrove soils from the Florida Keys to St. Augustine and Apalachicola Bay. So take it away, Josh. All right, thanks, Jenna. All right, thanks, thanks for organizing this meeting as well. This is, so I'm a new faculty member at the Coastal and Marine Lab at FSU, and I've, I've been here since August. And so the, the timing of this symposium is pretty awesome because it's given me a chance to present some of my initial research here, but then also get just a sense of all the other work that's going on here. So. Uh, I also want to, as I get started on my talk, make sure I acknowledge all my co-authors because this is a very collaborative effort that I'm presenting on today. Uh, and I want to front and center give uh, credit to Kevin Engelbert, who's a research technician helping me get my lab started and has been very instrumental in helping get samples from Apalachicola Bay that are going to be presented today. But overall, our collaborative group here includes people from uh, University of South Florida, University of Central Florida, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission and University of Florida. And um, so even though those folks aren't here today, uh, definitely wanna make sure this, this collaborative data set is recognized. I think there's just a little lag in the advance, so I think we're good. So my roadmap today in terms of where I wanna go, I'm, I'm gonna talk about what this process of loss on ignition is and how we can use that to estimate organic carbon in soils of things like mangroves, these blue carbon environments that are rich in carbon. and while that might seem like somewhat of an esoteric sort of methodological paper to be presenting in this context, I want to I'm going to bring it back to some ecological importance for uh, Apalachicola Bay that I I have personally found very interesting. So I think you'll you'll find it um, rewarding to stick with me through this. Um, the second stage of the talk, I'm going to talk about sort of the the context within the literature about what kind of conversion equations are used to estimate carbon. And then I'm gonna spend a, a lot of the talk kind of evaluating the primary data set we have from sites all throughout Florida and finish up with some, some tiebacks to Apalachicola Bay and the relevance here. Okay, so if, if you're not familiar with it, loss on ignition is a very simple procedure that we can use to quantify how much organic matter is present in soil. And so it's composed of two equally important steps. Uh, and again, very simple, but basically what you're trying to do during the drying process is remove all the water from your sample. So you start with a dry soil sample. And then the second step is you're combusting it in a furnace and that removes all the organic matter. And so in this little cartoon on the right, what I wanna focus on is at the bottom there, there's two pools that are present in your solid soil after the water's been removed. There's the, the SOM, the soil organic matter, and there's the SIM, the mineral material. Within the organic matter uh, component, organic carbon really represents the largest fraction of, of what we're interested in. So you can actually use um, the relationship between organic matter and that major component of carbon to build a linear equation that allows you to estimate how much carbon's there. Now, why this is relevant is because if, if, you, if you've heard anything about blue carbon, it's this, this effort to sort of quantify and understand the importance of carbon that's sequestered in coastal wetlands all around the globe. And what that means is there's a lot of places where surveys are being done to quantify how deep the soil is and how much carbon is there. Well, that involves very extensive field work. And it's, it's, it's a lot of hard manual labor to collect multiple cores. And then you literally can have hundreds of samples. And so from a just a cost and logistics standpoint, if you're working in kind of remote locations, it can be difficult and uh, costly to measure soil organic carbon for all of those. And especially in some countries, you know, you don't maybe have access to a lab that has an elemental analyzer that can actually measure the carbon for you, but it's much easier to have access to a furnace. And so the idea is in places like that where you have all these samples, you can run LOI and estimate how much carbon you've got. So the complication here is that there is simply no good equation for mangroves that's existing in the literature. There's a great equation for salt marshes that was developed uh, and published back in 1991, 30 years ago now. Um, there's been a good one published for seagrasses as well, but mangroves have, have been a little bit harder to get a handle on because there is so much variability. 
this cartoon on, on this figure though, I wanna just sort of orient you to how I'm gonna talk about things throughout the rest of the talk. And what I want you to focus on is that black line in the middle. In this case, it's an average. So if you have a, a slope of 0 0.5, what you can interpret that as a percentage. So what that's saying is that organic carbon represents 50% of soil organic matter. And then that slope, the blue lines, the dark or the light blue basically indicate that the percentage of carbon present in the organic matter increases or decreases. Something that's very important though is to think about what the intercept in this equation represents. And I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but those are the, the green line and the, the dashed orange lines. Those are essentially methodological errors where you have either been insufficiently, re you're insufficiently removing all the water that was present in your sample, or in the case of the green line, you've had, or, uh, you've had inorganic carbon in the presence of carbonate, which can be carbonate muds or shell or that kind of thing. You have that kind of carbon that's still present in your sample that may throw off your relationship. So our specific interest is organic carbon and organic matter. And I'm gonna be focusing really on the slope term throughout this talk. Okay, so if thus far, if I haven't lost you, hopefully this table will be the start of where the story can start to get interesting and I can pull people back in away from sort of the, the details of the methods. Because certainly this table is where I really got interested in this project. So this is a collection of records from the literature you can see on the left sort of a list of places um, throughout the world, these are 13 locations that have derived a local equation relating organic carbon to organic matter. Um, and this is since 2010. And this all sort of coincides with this blue carbon um, expansion of interest around the globe, which sort of is about the same time. The thing I want you to focus on, so the, the yellow and the blue boxes highlight that there's a wide range of methods that people have used to, to quantify this. And there's a pretty wide range of organic matter that's been present in the soils where these equations have been derived. That's important, that's interesting, but that's not what I'm gonna focus on, but I want you to sort of be aware of that. The red box is where this gets really interesting. And I just lost my sight, okay, there it is. So the box is sorted in order from least to greatest. And again, I wanna remind you of what that slope term means. It means that's the fraction of organic matter represented by carbon. So we have some locations throughout Vietnam, Singapore, et cetera. These are showing values of 0 0.23, 0 0.25, somewhere in there. That's saying carbon represents about 25% of that organic matter. If you go all the way down south, that value basically increases, or sorry, not down south, just down your column. Those numbers increase up to carbon representing numbers I would usually expect, more like 50%. And then even a value as high as 87% in Ecuador. And I'll tell you why I think this is where our story starts to get interesting is because when I look at that, my initial reaction is there's got to be a problem there. There's got to be a mistake because that just doesn't make sense that the values could range that much. And you look in the literature before this, and that's sort of the accepted uh, sense as well, that this should sort of, sort of be in the 40 to 50 range. So keep that in mind as we move forward. All right, thank you. So that global table inspired this local effort where we went out across Florida and I worked with those collaborators to collect data from, from 10 different regions where we have mangroves located in Florida and collect soil data from each of those. And I wanna point out uh, the, the figure down the lower left, that's uh, from Apalachicola Bay. So these are the locations that um, we went out and sampled on the backside of Dog Island at All Tides Cove and at Pilots Cove. And so that represents our Apalachicola Bay, but then we also have uh, collaborators with data from St. Augustine, uh, Merritt Island, Wakasasa Bay, Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor. Uh, the 10,000 Islands region, that, that data point actually includes some things from the Rookery Bay NUR that's involved. And then um, Biscayne National Park, Everglades National Park, and the Lower Keys. So it's a really nice range of, of different uh, mangrove sites that are included. The two primary questions that we want to go after with this project are just trying to figure out what's the best overall general equation we can use for mangroves. And then the second question, which is honestly, I think a little more interesting for me is what drives the variability in the slope? You think about that global table I showed you, how can there possibly be that much variability in the slope and what contributes to that? Okay, so this is the data then. And I want you to focus uh, at first here on the, the left 
panel. And this is our total data cloud from all the sites. So we have 999 samples that are included here. And I don't know how well you can see it, but there's basically two uh, regressions fitted there. So one is a linear fit, and that's, I've got like a little blue box drawn around that. And that's kind of as we would expect for our total data set, basically seeing a slope of about 50. So carbon is representing about 50% of the organic matter in those sites, across all of our sites averaged together. However, what was interesting is, is there's actually, it doesn't provide much of a better fit, but the quadratic fit um, has an intercept that's right at zero. So in terms of providing utility to the global blue carbon uh, folks, that's kind of more useful because it's it's able to at low carbon values, which many many uh, mangrove locations do have soil that's actually fairly low, less than 10% organic matter. Um, if you can have a, a, a equation that allows you not to get negative carbon values, it's more useful for people. So that's something to keep in mind. But one thing that's uh, important to think about too is that that quadratic fit has some precedent in the literature because the, the Marsh paper itself from Chris Kraft et al in 91, they had a quadratic fit. And so based on that, if we split our data set on the right panel there into three different groups, we basically split it in thirds and look at linear regressions there. You can see that the, the lower two, the, the black and the green dots, the slopes there are still pretty close to 50. It's 0.465 and 0.499. Um, not dramatically different, but what is interesting is when you get up to those samples with really high organic matter, so above 60% organic matter, that slope is now up to 65. And so there's a major difference that happens there. And that's something that's kind of interesting to explore. Okay, so that was the whole data set together. This is then if we take that and, and break it down by, by regions. And again, focus mostly just on the slope here. And what's kind of humbling to, to reach this is, is remember that global data set. I told you I was immediately skeptical of the values because the ranges were from the 20s up to the 80s. And how crazy is it that even within our Florida data set, we end up with ranges from the 20s all the way up to the 80s. And so completely took me by surprise and really has given us some food for thought and allows us to explore sort of what's happening. And you'll notice too, here's Apalachicola Bay up near the top with a, a value in the upper 30s. So what's happening here? Well, one of the, the crazy, really surprising things from this is that there's, there's actually a latitudinal effect here. So the, the panel on the left shows the slopes of each of those different sites across Florida, those different regions that we worked with. And you can see basically you start with a shallow slope in the northern sections and it gets increasingly steep in that slope as you move south. The Apalachicola Bay is, is mislabeled as SB here. It's this orange line, the third one up. So it's still, you know, it's, it's kind of falling off the major set of averages, but it's still kind of steep. And if you look at it on the right then, this is the, the slope for each region with the error bars um, representing the uncertainty in that slope derived from each region, plotted as a function of latitude. And what this is saying, and this is a pretty strong fit and, and significant, what this is saying is at these higher latitudes, you have a slope that is lower or again, shallower than those other ones. So what does that mean? It means that carbon represents a lower fraction of the organic matter here. And as you move to the more Southern sites, carbon represents a greater fraction of the soil organic matter there. And so what, what exactly does that mean and, and what do we take away from that? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say up front that this is still something I'm working on. There's, there's a lot of, of things to still explore, but one of the things to think about is, is temperature. And where Mike and, and Kate were talking about sort of these freeze events in terms of where the vegetation is moving, um, if you're thinking about soil processing, mean annual temperature is, is a good gross proxy for sort of microbial activity and respiration of the, of the carbon that's in the soil there. And you can see in this case, it's a, it's a, again, it's a significant, pretty strong fit that places like Apalachicola Bay, where our mean annual temperature is a little bit lower than those further south, you have a slope that's shallower. So again, carbon represents a somewhat lower percentage of the organic matter than it does as you move further south. And so actually I wanna do something a little bit different here. I wanna to skip to the next slide. And I want to go back to that Chris Kraft et al. paper from 91 and pull a quote 
that they bring up. So they talk about how the, the proportion of organic carbon in organic matter increased with increasing soil organic matter content, probably as a result of aging. So I wanna emphasize that word aging there. In old organic soils, carbon to organic matter increased to 57 to 60% due to the accumulation of more reduced organic materials. And so now I'm gonna go back to that previous slide and explain what I mean by that or what they mean by that. Aging is kind of fun because what that basically is, it's a, it's a function of degradation. It's like something can become more aged without necessarily being any older than something else based on how much it has been degraded or how much uh, microbial activity has happened there. And so this is where it starts to get to what I think is some ecological relevance for a place like Apalachicola Bay, which is that if you look at, at those organic, the, the slopes that we have in that equation relating carbon to organic matter, it's positively correlated to the organic carbon to total nitrogen ratio of those soils. So what is that? What's the takeaway there? If, if your eyes are glossing over in terms of what the stoichiometry or, or the, the chemistry means, just think about this. What it, what it's saying is that basically a lot of what's changing in this slope is a function of nitrogen loss. And so if you would start with a place like down in South Florida, where there's much higher carbon relative to organic matter, it means there's they've been depleted in nitrogen. Whereas if you move to sites like this up in the north, like Apalachicola Bay, there's more nitrogen left in the soil relative to carbon. That has a lot of implications for the thing Mike was talking about in his talk with tropicalization. If we start to think about, and again, not necessarily the cold temperatures, but if we just think about warming temperatures, increasing the activities, you can start to imagine these northern soils starting to look a little bit more like those southern soils which means this whole blue carbon conversation actually means we need to start thinking about nitrogen as well and nitrogen loss. So if I can advance, the things I wanna conclude with um, are, are kind of broad at this point, but the one is there is a nice general equation we're able to provide from this data set. Um, but I actually think the more working on this project, I've grown less interested in that general equation because a general equation kind of just averages out over all these, these different soil conditions. And so it actually may not be that interesting. Maybe there may be some other things like that second bullet point I'm emphasizing. I think the best thing to do is use an equation if you can, based on how much organic matter content you have, because there is variability based on that. The third point there though, I think is what we need to, to start exploring a little bit more is, is how much these relationships can help us learn things about what's happening with nitrogen in these environments. And so the, this final takeaway, I think the big one is that there's a potential that what this relationship indicates by starting out to explore just carbon and organic matter, we're actually getting some insights about what global warming and, and sort of the increasingly warm temperatures moving north in Florida are gonna have to do with nitrogen in our soils. Um, and again, there's lots of questions about um, what that's gonna look like in terms of, of the, that's going directly back to the atmosphere or if it's going out into our waterways. And that certainly has big implications for a place like Apalachicola Bay, where there's already a concern about oysters and the water filtering capabilities that they have. So if we're adding more nitrogen to the waters and the oysters aren't there to, to help filter, there's kind of compounding concerns there. The last thing, I, if I can just throw in um, a note about other research interests I have across the, the, the bay and the river itself, just to sort of throw this out there if there's people that are working on these things or collaborators, I'd, I'd love to talk more. So the first big thing is I'm, I'm very interested in exploring more and more the difference between the red and black mangroves and the, the marshes that are already here. And then in terms of inorganic carbon, I'm very interested in looking at loss terms in terms of dissolution of, of carbonate, whether it's oyster shell um, intertidally or subtidally, and then exploring more of the, the river flood plain, understanding carbon burial, carbon fluxes, nutrient fluxes, as well as just sediment loss from the floodplain to the bay and all that sort of tying together with this, the general interest in sea level rise monitoring and, and sort of experimenting to see what those effects are. So I apologize, I know I've gone a little bit long and there's not much time left, but, but if we do have time, I'd, I'd love to take questions and uh, I'm happy to follow up afterwards as well if, if people want to. Thanks so much. All right, I am not seeing anything in the question box and where anybody with their hand raised currently. Um, we are a little bit low on time. Um, so since I'm not seeing anything, I will direct people to our Padlet. That's a great way to uh, 
interact with uh, people after their time has passed and you can't do a face-to-face, -face, uh, you're certainly welcome to ask questions on their part of the Padlet uh, and we will um, follow up there. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Jenna. Thanks, Josh and Josh. Um, yes, the Padlet is a great way to connect and uh, I will steal from Renee Collini over at uh, what was formerly known as the Sentinel Site Cooperative uh, for uh, the data personals that they post in the, the cooperative ter tertiary. Um, so we hope that you guys take advantage of that if you have interest in connecting with, uh, with Josh. So we are at time for a 15 minute break. And so um, uh, just come back at 10.50 and we will continue on. And, and thank you everybody for uh, hanging, hanging with us this morning and um, hope you are as excited as I am to, to see uh, the rest of the presentations today. So we'll see you in 15 minutes. Welcome back. Get ready to get started here. Just wanna go over um, in your dashboard, you'll see a question function and you can actually type questions in there. You'll also see a hand raise function. And um, if Josh sees you, he'll, he'll call on you to ask a question. Um, next, we wanna welcome Dr. Michael Martinez Colon with uh, Florida A&M University. And he's gonna talk about the overview of ongoing projects to assess environmental health conditions in Appalachia Bay. Okay, doke. Uh... Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, I'm guessing yeah, I share my webcam. Okay. So as you can see, I'm in the lab. So <laughs> anyway, um, let me see here. Oh, perfect. So again, so thank you all uh, for um, for being here. Uh, you know, especially given this this conditions and there's been uh, also remote remotely. So it's it's very interesting. And so far, um, I'm very happy. Um, so, like it was mentioned, is this is just an, a brief overview of all the projects or ongoing projects that I have um, running at uh, Apachicola Bay with my grad students. So, just as a brief background, I'm I'm a geologist by training. Uh, there you go. I'm a geologist. Oh, they need to say next, right? Or can I run it myself? I you forgot. can run it yourself. Okay, perfect. Uh, so by training, I'm a geologist, and then I have a PhD in uh, oceanography. So I joined the School of the Environment at MU in August 2016. So a few months later, I reached out to J um, uh, Megan Lamb and Jason Garwood about what are the, the needs for research, and specifically, what are the research questions that they need to be answered to see if, 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 if it complements uh, what I do. And luckily it does. So we have a lot of collaboration going on. And in 2019, I was invited to become part of the research advisory committee of um, Upper Chicola Bay. So, so far, so good. We're doing uh, several research projects in Upper Chicola Bay. Um, so, okay. So the purpose again overall is to give an idea to local and stakeholders, um, research initiatives that are undergoing uh, in Upper Chicola Bay. And the main objective is hopefully this will trigger future um, collaborations with uh, uh, members of the audience. I'm just thinking. There you go. So I I work with benthic forams. I use them as bioindicators of um, pollution and also as bioindicators of environmental stress, if it's natural or anthropogenic. So what are forams? So forams are protists. Um, unlike people think that they are um, plants, they're not plants, they're animals, they're zooplankton, so they're part of the my, uh, myofauna. And in a nutshell, think of, of a forum. Here we have an amoeba, an amoeba, an amoeba down here. So imagine that that amoeba secretes a, a shell of calcium carbonate, and in a nutshell, that's a forum. Um, forums were thought at the beginning to be amoeba-like, but you know, now they're, they're protists. Um, benthic forams, they are carnivores as well as the tritivores. Uh, they undergo rapid as well 
uh, I mean, rapid sexual and asexual reproduction. So this is a good thing because when you have a rapid environmental change, then those benthic forms, they will reproduce asexually. So that, that's why you are always going to have overall relatively high numbers of benthic forms. These are microscopic organisms. So you're going to have high numbers of benthic forms when you have uh, impacted environments. Now, benthic forms, some of them, they have a, um, a calcareous shell, so they biomineralize calcium carbonate. Others, they don't do that. They just take sediments from the surrounding environment, and then they create this um, their shell made out of sediments, and we call those agglutinated. But we have some individuals that they don't use sediments, they don't biomineralize calcium carbonate, and all they have is like an over-thickened outer organic wall. And we call them uh, naked forams, and we tend to find this um, in shallow water settings as well as in freshwater, the naked forum um, ones. Now, because most of the earth is covered by seawater, benthic forams are ubiquitous. We have more than 3,000 known living species of benthic forams, and like most organisms in marine ecosystems, they are susceptible and resilient to stress. And also, they follow pollution gradients. So they're mobile, they move around slowly but surely, but they will move around. So when it comes to uh, um, estuaries, we all know that they receive a lot of contaminants, heavy metals, pesticides, nowadays microplastics. So depending on my research question, I work with benthic forans from a point of view of individuals. So if I'm working with a particular species, then I'm interested in bioaccumulation of, of contaminants. Also, it is it has been documented that in the presence of heavy metals, benthic forams, th their shells will deform. So that's another proxy of an environmental stress in the environment. Now, if I'm interested in communities, then I like to look at the ecological response of this fundamental communities on a spatial and temporal time scale. And what I mean temporal could be seasonal, but it can also mean uh, decadal, centennial, and even millennial. It depends on the length of the core, and they were lucky with uh, getting dates. Uh, so look at uh, changes in abundance, diversity, dominance of, of key taxa that will help us understand those environments. So that's for, uh, forms in a nutshell. So how are they so useful? Well, they are sensitive. So they they respond very fast to any minute change in the, um, in the environment. Could be pH, salinity, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, a change in sediment type, contaminants. They are precise as well because they're predictable. If you know how the, the community behaves in the presence of a salinity change or oxygen change or heavy metal change in the sediments, when you look at a core and you look back in time, you can predict, oh, if we see this change in the assemblage, it's because we have X, Y, and C changes in the environment. Also, because they have a great preservation potential, uh, I mean, we have um, fossil foraminifera from 500 million years ago because they're great uh, preservation potential. We can use them to identify preconditions, baseline conditions in a sediment core. And this is needed by resource managers. You know, how can we fix this environmental issue today if we don't know what it was 20 years ago or 50 years ago? So benthic forums will give you that, um, could provide you, let me rephrase that, uh, that answer, with that answer. And also, they are sentinel species. And what I mean by sentinel, because they live in equilibrium with seawater, of course. So when they are biomineralizing, whatever physiochemical signature that is in the seawater is going to be recorded in the shell of the benthic forums. So you, we can also rely on the chemistry of the shell to assess changes in salinity in the past, uh, for example. And of course, we know about paleoceanography, that uh, plantonic forams are awesome uh, when it comes to paleoceanographic um, studies. I work with benthic um, one minute, for, not the plantonic ones. So I also work with heavy metals. That, that's my main, uh, main purpose is to work with, with heavy metals. Now, the concern about heavy metals and forams is about bioavailability. Just because uh, um, a coastal area is, is highly polluted with copper and zinc, just for sake of the argument, it doesn't mean that those high concentrations are bioavailable to the benthic forum. 
And that's one thing that we see in the literature when uh, researchers are trying to use forams as indicators of pollution is because they do not consider uh, bioavailability. So my research for the past, what, eight, nine years, it's showing that, that when you're looking at heavy metals, you can have different chemical fractions in which you can find that metal. My research is show, is, has shown, actually, that if you have heavy metals associated with the carbonate fraction or associated with um, manganese and iron oxides, they will not be bioavailable to benthic forms. So heavy metals found in the chemical fraction, which is, sorry, in the organic fraction, which is this F4 oxidizable, or in the F1 associated with, with clay site sediments, those two fractions are the most bioavailable specifically um, to benthic forms. So, so that's one thing that, that we're trying in my lab is just to keep showing um, people in my field that we need to consider more the use of bioavailability of heavy metals, specifically with forms. So just because a metal is bioavailable to a benthic forum, it doesn't mean that it's going to be bioavailable to a fish. For example, now I'm just going to highlight just the current thesis and dissertation projects that are uh, that are being done in my lab. So the first one is by uh, Lexa Medero. She's a master student. She's funded by the uh, Golf Research Program, and her per and the purpose of her thesis is to assess the relationship between benthic forms and microbial communities in Apalachicola Bay with respect to heavy metals. It is known that if you have a um, an estuary polluted with heavy metals, you will have um, the overabundance of key taxa of benthic forams in those sediments. So the question is, do, the for, do those taxa have an inherent ability or fitness to survive those conditions, or is it the bacteria mediating uh, the impact of the heavy metals with respect to um, to the benthic forms. So this is just to show you um, some of our results. What we have here in those these pie charts, here we have station one, which is typically more normal marine conditions when it comes to salinity. Station eight is closer to the mouth of the Apachicola River. And each of the pie charts represents four chemical fractions. Remember, what is more bioavailable to the forams is F1 and F4. So as you can see here, you do have noticeable changes in the bioavailability of those metals with respect to forams when it comes to different stations associated with salinity. And in the bottom pie, char pie charts is just um, the distribution or uh, abundance of um, microbial genera. So station one, which is the, the lower left um, pie chart, we only have one genus that was able to be uh, an identifiable genus. When we look at station eight, we have a higher abundance of uh, uh, microbial genera. So right now, Alexa, she is you know, processing the data and running statistics to see what are uh, the, the correlations, um, if any. And one key aspect of this is to see um, what is the relationship of, of this um, genera with respect to heavy metals and if they help in mediating the effects of heavy metals. The next project is by my PhD student, um, Margaret. So her talk is right after mine. And she's been funded by NOAA's um, Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems, which is hosted at the School of the Environment at Time U. And the purpose of her dissertation overall is to assess the performance of microbial and foraminiferal indices. So she's going to be testing the market GMB and the forum MB as, as proxies of environmental health. So I don't want to steal her thunder, but I'm just going to show you two quick maps that she provided. Um, what you see here is just the total number of foraminiferal individuals in, her, in, all her station, in all her stations between dry season and then wet season. And, and you do see noticeable differences. Um, a seasonal difference uh, between this. So, of course, this relates to uh, our freshwater input, salinity, uh, and other physicochemical parameters. But she'll talk a bit more in detail um, about that. The next project that we have is by another PhD student. And uh, the main goal for him is to assess the historical evolution of environmental health of um, Abalchicola Bay. 
I should be going on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, to get sediment cores. Um, hopefully, we're going to be getting um, dates. Let's see some dating. Fingers crossed. We haven't been that successful yet. But the idea is to, um, you know, to prove that they uh, um, how neat it is to use Venticorums when it comes to assessing um, baseline um, conditions. So this is funded by the Alfred Peace Loan Foundation as well as by the uh, APSI um, group. And I didn't got a chance to add the logo, but AFSI is also co-funding uh, this dissertation project. Now, what I'm going to show you is, is a publication that came out uh, in January. Um, this is from Brazil, uh, uh, Lagoon in Brazil. So this is what we want to do in Apachicola Bay. So, oh, in time. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to highlight here on the uh, on the left side you have the ammonia aufidium. This is an index, a, a benthic forum index of oxygenation. So at 40 centimeters depth in the sediment core, you start seeing a degradation in oxygen levels in this lagoon in Brazil simply by looking at this ammonia aufidium forum index. When we look at SPI, which is the uh, the third graph from from the left. That's uh, sediment pollution index. So notice as well that post-1975, we have an increase in toxicity in this lagoon. And that's because you have a lot of zinc and cadmium that also began to increase considerably post-1975. But what happens below 40 centimeters? You basically have no or very small amounts of contaminants. So that's where we're going to assess pre-management or pre-impact conditions in Aparachicola Bay. So we're trying to reproduce this project from Brazil and do that in Aparachicola Bay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And lastly, but not least, we have another master's student who's also funded by NOAA's Coastal Center for uh, Marine Ecosystems, and he's looking at microplastics. So his main goal is to ground truth and validate a GIS model based on microplastic hotspot generation within the Apalachicola River. So based on the GIS model, which is uh, figure or panel A, this is the whole drainage basin of the river, uh, the, the ACF river basin. Now specifically on panel B, um, here we have the uh, sub watersheds of the Apalachicola River and the areas highlighted with darker colors, these are uh, based on the, the model, areas of high production of microplastics. So the goal is to go to those sites, sample water and sediments, and then to see if, if we in fact can determine high production of microplastics. And there's another project also with microplastics and which is in collaboration with Jason Garwood, um, which is about traffic transfer of uh, microplastics from sediments into benthic feeding um, fish. And that's basically it. It's, it's very fast, very short in a nutshell, just to give an idea of, of things that, that are, are being done in Apalachicola Bay by my grad students. So any questions, any comments? All right, thank you so much, Michael. Yes. Uh, I am not currently seeing anything in our question box. Oh, here we go. Lynn Wilder just came in with one actually. Um, have you looked at the influence of the Apalachicola River dredging on what you're trying to find in location eight over time? I'm sorry, repeat that again, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, have you looked at the influence of the Apalachicola River dredging on what you're finding in location eight over time? Um, not really. We do. I do have, um, how is it? Uh, we have, uh, I found published uh, uh, bathymetry maps, bathymetric maps of Apalachicola Bay. So we are staying away from those dredge sites because that's going to impact. Um, it's got it's, it's by it's by attribution. I mean, a topogenic by attribution, but also it's going to have a big influence if you're trying to date um, sediment cores because it's going to mix everything. So I'm staying completely away from from dredge from dredge areas. But it but dredging does affect um, circulation. There's an estuary in Puerto Rico. And, and, and dredging activities in that particular estuary um, cause a permanent stratification of the water column in, in, in that particular bay. 
but uh but at this point we're staying away from um from dredging sites if if that answered the question um yes uh there is a follow-up um mm -hmm. does the dredging material do you have a does that migrate uh to location eight do you have do you have to worry about that um i mean well i don't have a full knowledge of of um the water circulation in, in apachicola bay but if we refer to these bathymetric maps, they also show the, the spoils of the dredged material. So we also staying away from, from those. But you're right. I mean, depending on how strong is the uh, circulation, those particles will be, will be translocated. That, that's true. Um, and I don't know, to be honest, how we can determine that uh, um, in a core if, if the bioturbation is because of just transport of dredge material. But that's a good point, actually. OK, great. Um, unfortunately, I think that we're running pretty low on time, so I'm going to have to turn it over to Anita. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your questions. Thanks, Perfect. Josh. And uh, thanks, Dr. Martinez Colon. Our next mm -hmm. speaker, as, as Dr. Martinez Colon mentioned, is a student at FAMU, and her name is Margaret. Bayron Arsalai, and she's going to be talking to us about seasonal water quality and benthic um, <laughs> form, form, I can't say it, for Mia Farrow. <laughs> Sorry for butchering that. So, Margaret, take it away. Dr. Martinez Colon, maybe you could present for her? Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so we can. And work out her, her. Yeah, she's gonna change computers. Great, great. And great. as soon as she gets on, we'll switch her over. Okay. I'm gonna let you have the control. Um, okay, so I'll do my best um, in, uh, in presenting for Margaret while she's changing computers. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, she's presenting uh, preliminary data on the benthic corn distribution uh, based on wet and dry season in, um, um, not Pachicola Bay, of course. Um, okay, next slide. Here we go. And let me see here. Okay, so as we all know, uh, you know, esters these are ecotone uh, type of ecotone environment. So you have this this mixture of different type of ecosystems. You, know, you have fully terrestrial, fully marine. So, and you will notice, as you all know, in Pachicola, that you do have actual uh, seasonality based upon freshwater discharge coming in from uh, from the Apachicola River. And that's going to uh, play a role in um, the physiochemistry of, of estuarine processes, as well as with um, uh, biological processes of organisms. And, and a key aspect, oh, oh, and a key aspect is salinity. So in Apachicola Bay, you do have uh, strongly defined gradients in salinity. And, uh, and that's important when it comes to benthic forms. Uh, in my experience in Apachicola Bay, anything below a salinity of 18, 16, we're not gonna find any living forms or dead forms at all. It's like they're not, they cannot withstand such low, um, so such low salinities. So Apachicola is a river dominated um, type of estuary. You have a nice saltwater wedge uh, that comes in. And it does fluctuate with, uh, you know, with rainy season and, and freshwater input. And as we all know, um, Apachicola Bay is uh, has been experiencing anthropogenic stressors from the point of view of of contaminants as well as natural stressors. Because again, if you have these changes in, in freshwater input, and there she is, um, you're gonna have then uh, changes in salinity. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna let her continue. So don't forget to unmute yourself, Margaret. I think you might have to continue, Dr. Martinez Colon. Okay, I'll I'll keep going while while she's figuring yeah. that out. Um so let me see here. Okay, next slide. Okay. So as, as I mentioned before, uh benthic forums, you know, you can use they're very nice bioindicators. Um, so you can use them as a species level, at community level. It depends on, on the question that you are asking. 
Um, so what we have here in this image is these are some of the uh, species that uh, Margaret has found and identified in Apalachicola Bay. Um, how, um, now this one on the far right, Alphidium poyanum, uh, is quite abundant in Apalachicola Bay. And oh, species of uh, the genus Alphidium are not that tolerant to changes in oxygenation. So if, if oxygen levels decrease, this, uh, members of this uh, genus Alphidium, they will decrease in abundance. Um, now, like, like mentioned, they're protozoans, unicellular organisms. They, again, think of an amoeba, like with a shell. And, and again, because they, they are tolerant or sensitive to environmental changes, they are very good bioindicators. So the one on the left, Ammonia Parkinsoniana forma typica, this uh, benthic forum is the opposite of Ophidium. Ammonia can, uh, uh, thr it thrives under suboxic to anoxic conditions. Ophidium, it doesn't. Um, so here we have two different benthic forum species with different tolerances to oxygenation levels. So that's how we can use them as bioindicators. Um, loading, okay. Now to compare the effects of uh, seasonal water quality in Apachicola Bay in terms of wet and dry season, um, Margaret is, is working with the forum stress index and as well as the ammonia alphidium index. So the ammonia alphidium is a, a hypoxic type of proxy. It'll tell you oxygenation levels in a, in a particular coastal environment. But the forum stress index, it determines the magnitude of pollution by using the relative abundance of sensitive um, taxa in relationship to stress tolerant taxa. So when you look at those relationships, then you can have an idea if you have normal pristine conditions when you have values between 9 and 10, or if you have heavily polluted or uh, azoic sediments, if you have forum stress index values less than 2. So that's how we can assess environmental health on surface samples. But now imagine if we're doing that down core, then we can assess those same conditions and establish baselines. And I'm waiting for it to change slide. Okay, there we go. Oh, sorry about that, there we go. So th this is the distribution of her sampling stations. And, and like I mentioned, uh, she did um, wet season, dry season. Um, sampling in Apachicola Bay. Now she did uh, water samples and she took water samples, sediment samples, and these are the parameters that she uh, is analyzing for. So she's basically presenting uh, uh, benthic forum, but we also did our, our standard SOP is grain size and total organic carbon in, in all the sediment samples. Now, based on, on these results, uh, you have uh, noticeable differences between dry and wet and dry season, which is, again, is, is not that surprising. Uh, uh. Okay, for Tayan Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. She said that she can talk now. So, do you guys hear me? Yes, you're coming through. Okay, Absolutely. that sounds right. That sounds nice. Um, I don't know why it doesn't let me share the the video but at least you guys can hear me so that's something uh so as he was telling the results we did analyze the environmental parameters per season and we found that the temperature dissolved oxygen and salinity and ph were significant difference between seasons temperature was uh, higher in wet season whether whether dissolved oxygen salinity and ph was high during dry season um this is consistent because in wet season uh, was in April, so April it's uh, it's a hotter month per se or has a high temperature value, so temperatures would be higher on, during the wet season that we chose. And then on dry season, uh, dissolved oxygen was higher, which dissolved oxygen is tend to be higher on, on seasons that are on temperatures that are lower, uh, such as dry season. And also we found that salinity was lower during dry season. Dry season is characterized by the low freshwater inflows. So it 
is the uh, ocean tends to dominate, salinity tends to be higher during dry season. And then if the ocean tends to dominate during the dry season, then pH also will be higher because ocean pH is higher than the freshwater one. So those are uh, consistent. Mm. Does it does the slide change automatically? Uh, you can click to advance it as needed. Uh huh. You click on it, it's going to take a while and then it'll change, you know. Okay. Let me make sure you have uh, mouse control. Okay, try it. I just click on it, but it, it's not moving. Oh, now it is. Okay. So when we look at the the spatial distribution of the environmental parameters, we can see that. Um, First of all, uh, based on the legend of the graphs, we can see the darker colors are the lower values and then the lighter colors are the higher values. And we can see that temperature uh, during wet season, it has lower values in the stages near the river. And then as we go out to the ocean, it tends to get uh, higher values. Then when we move for temperature for dry season, it does, it does the opposite of that. It has the higher values, the higher values near the, the stations of the river and then the, low, the lower values in the stations that are closer to the ocean. So dissolved oxygen does the same as temperature, but uh, also again opposite and that's that that makes sense based on the temperature. Uh, the salt oxygen is gonna be higher on those temperatures that are lower. So it makes sense that does the opposite as temperature in distribution. And then on salinity, we see uh, higher uh, values uh, near the ocean and then smaller values near the, uh, in the stations near the river, which is also makes sense based freshwater inflows will have a, a lower salinity than the ones that are, than the stations that are more closer to the ocean. And then we didn't see a, a, a pattern on, on pH. It was uh, kind of all over the place. Uh, so when we're talking, uh, then we move on to seeing what, what the results with nutrients and then we got there were significant difference between seasons although uh, phosphate was not significant different ammonia nitrate and nitrate was significant different ammonia and nitrate was actually higher during wet season whereas uh, nitrate was higher only during dry season um nutrient concentration in estuaries it depends a lot on uh, runoff, uh, on river and input. So uh, the difference that some of them are high in dry season, some of them are higher in wet season, could be attributed to rainfall, heavy rainfall, river and inputs runoff. And we can see in the distribution or patterns, if they come up. So in the distribution of patterns, again, in wet season, we didn't see a, a pattern among all three uh, significant different nutrients. Um, again, it's wet season. It could be the river and alpha, the river and inputs are moving all the nutrients among the old estuary, giving them different values. It could be the local, in, in the local rainfall inputting nutrients from different um, places such as runoff that could be the wise there's no pattern uh in dry season though we can see that the pattern uh for uh the ammonia nitrate and nitrate is that they have higher values near the river and then as we go to the stations that are closer to the ocean the values get low, uh, decreases 
So we can see that there's maybe free running flow and their concentration there, but since there's not, it's not wet, like wet season that there's a complete flow, well, they're not spreading out uh, through all the estuary. So then we move to analyze the particular organic carbon and the T total organic carbon. So particular organic carbon is the carbon in the water column and total organic carbon was in the sediment. Um, both of them were significantly different between the seasons. They were actually higher during wet season. And Again, when we see the, the 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 spatial patterns of the of the POC and the TOC, we can see that there's no pattern, uh, there's no consistent pattern during wet season. I mean, this could be also again uh, carbon tends to go to the estuaries based on exported material that goes from the land, the rivers, and the groundwater. And also, it could be something as uh, autochthonous production from the same. So uh, this could be why there's no pattern. However, in dry season, we see the same pattern as we see in the uh, the, the later ones that I mentioned. There's a uh, higher values of POC and TOC near the stations, the stations near the river, and as we go out into the ocean, then those stations have lower values of POC and TOC. So for mud content, because we did a grain size analysis, the mud, the mud content among the different the, the two seasons were not significantly different um, between them. So they were they were similar, and they did um, in their uh, spatial distribution. Uh, they were also uh, similar, being that they had uh, the higher mud concentration was higher in the stations near the river. And then as we go out, um, the concentration of, small, of mud was lower, which makes sense because, I mean, they're closer to the ocean. So sand is going to dominate over mud that's going to dominate in the river and inputs or, or those stations that are near the river. So when we move to talk about the community parameters, uh, we analyze the abundance with it, which is basically the number of individuals, and then the species, which is, which is the number of species. And we also did the channel diversity index, capability, and for all of those, we didn't have a significant difference between wet and dry season. Uh, when we move to talk about the, the two ecological index that we use, the forum stress index and the ammonia and pedium index, we saw that the ammonia alpidium index was not significant difference between the wet and dry season, but the ammonia alpidium index did have a significant difference between the seasons. It actually was higher during the wet season. Um, this makes sense since uh, species of ammonia and alpidium were the most abundant specimens in our samples. It makes sense that this. Uh, index was the one that worked better. Um, when we move uh, to see the, the, the distribution of uh, how the index move, uh, we can see that uh, it actually do, don't have a pattern and, and um, I don't know if it was mentioned before, but the uh, morning medium index, basically it tells us the hypoxic conditions of the site basically at low concentrations of oxygen, and the index goes from zero to 100. The closer it is to 100, the higher the hypoxic conduction sinks or the lower concentration of oxygen. Of oxygen. Um, so even though we didn't uh, found any um, a statistical difference between community parameters. Uh, we did a non-metric MDS. Um, we did a non-metric MDS, which is to see if the composition of species was significantly different 
between seasons, so when we're talking about composition, is that even though the number of species between the seasons could be the same number, I could have 15 species in one season and 15 in the other ones, the individuals or the, the ones that are there are may, may not or may be the same. So, and the graph that we say to, to our right, we have two colors, dry season is for red and then uh, blue season is, uh, one season is blue. We can see that the two colors uh, uh, get together at some point. So those are the species that they share or common in both seasons, but there are also a couple of them that are not the same. And there were actually 18 species that were only exclusive for wet season. You can only find them in wet season. And there were only three species that were exclusive for dry season. And I put uh, a couple of examples there from species that were not shared between them. Um, as a closer remark, we did compare the effects of seasonal water quality. We did find that uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, salinity, pH, ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, POC, and TOC were significantly different between seasons. Uh, we also did find that the ecological index, the ammonia and pH index was different in between seasons. Um, however, we did a pre we did a person correlation. Um, uh, to see if there was a relationship among the money alpidium index and some of these uh, parameters, but we didn't find any relationship between their, uh, their general pattern of distribution. And okay, that, well, thank, <laughs> thank you so much, Margaret. I'm glad we, we overcame our technical difficulties. Uh, Thank you so much. And if you have a question for Margaret, please put it in the, uh, the questions function. And next up, we have Megan Lamb with the Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve. And she's with our research section. And she's going to tell us about um, Apalachicola Bay zooplankton communities and linkages to nutrient inputs and primary productivity. Take it away, Megan. Thanks, Anita. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Anita said, um, I'm Megan Lamb, and I'm a biologist here at the Appalachia Culinaire. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, the long-term nutrient and zooplankton uh, monitoring programs um, at Aner and how they relate together. There we go. All right, so Aner initiated our zooplankton monitoring program to fill a gap in our understanding of trophic dynamics in the Apalachicola Bay. Um, zooplankton communities are an intermediate link between primary productivity and higher trophic level processes. They're an important food source for many organisms, and they can be indicative of estuarine condition. So Aner has been conducting long-term water quality, nutrient, and chlorophyll monitoring programs that measure the nutrient inputs and gross primary productivity in the bay. And we also have long-term necton monitoring programs representing higher trophic levels, uh, which you'll hear more about tomorrow from Jason Garwood. Um, so monitoring secondary productivity in the bay will help us bridge the gap between uh, these two monitoring programs. We, there have been some short-term studies looking at Apalachicola Bay zooplankton communities and studies linking uh, primary and secondary productivity on shorter time scales. So we wanted to update these findings and look at the long-term trends in zooplankton communities. So the goal of Aner's zooplankton monitoring project is to examine zooplankton community abundance and species distribution throughout the Apalachicola Bay and how it relates to environmental variables, nutrient inputs, and primary productivity. So zooplankton monitoring efforts are informed by analysis of long-term nutrient data. So before I get into the zooplankton, I'm going to look at trends in the long-term nutrient and pigment data and uh, what trends these predictions allow us uh, to make about the, zo the Bay's zooplankton communities. So to first give you a quick background about the methods for our nutrient and chlorophyll monitoring programs, um, the nutrient program was initiated in 2002 and is ongoing. It's part of the National Reserve System System-wide Monitoring Program, or SWAMP, that uh, Chris talked about in his kickoff this morning. 
Monitoring takes place monthly and has both spatial and temporal components. Um, and we collect a whole, um, a lot of water for a whole suite of analyte analysis and um, also chlorophyll. Um, you can see the list on your screen there. And when we're out collecting um, the water for the nutrient and chlorophyll analysis, we also collect a whole suite of abiotic factors and other field parameters. And the analysis that I'm going to show um, has been conducted in primer, which uh, Jay will also be discussing um, primer's capabilities more tomorrow. So I'm not going to go into that now. <laughs> So this map shows Aner's swamp station locations in relation uh, to the bay. The, uh, the yellow squares represent locations where data loggers collect abiotic data around the clock, and the black dots are the spatial nutrient and chlorophyll collection locations. So the stations represent habitat types and salinity regimes throughout the bay. So this includes a freshwater station in the Apalachicola River up here, and a saltwater station in the Gulf of Mexico down here, Sykes Cut Off Shore, and the stations in the Northeast East Bay area uh, represent lower salinity areas that experience outflow from river distributaries and runoff from the surrounding forest. And then conditions in the uh, middle and outer areas of the bay are highly dependent on river flow, tides, and climate conditions such as wind. And just a quick note that most locations are single stations, but um, the East Bay surface and bottom stations are two stations at one location. Um, they're taken at different depths because we have two water quality data loggers deployed at the surface and bottom at two different depths at this location. So this metric MDS plot of the long-term nutrient and pigment data shows the similarity between stations. So the closer the icons are to each other, the more similar further away, the more dissimilar the stations. And the MDS um, found a very good solution with a low stress level of 0 0.04. And I've left the map of sampling locations to the side to remind you where the stations are located geographically. Um, but we see a triangle on the MDS plot of the river, uh, east bay surface and bottom, and the offshore uh, as being most dissimilar. And this looks a lot like the triangle that we see um, on the geographical map of the stations with those stations being furthest apart geographically. Um, so the river and offshore stations do represent the fresh and saltwater end members. We expect them to be very different. Um, the river station is pretty dissimilar to the other sites. It most closely resembles the East Bay Bridge Station, which is the closest station to the river mouth outflow. And you see East Bay surfing the bottom are um, the most dissimilar from both the river and offshore stations. And um, they're not that similar to the geographically close East Bay Bridge Station either. So there could be something going on in those upper reaches of East Bay. And the mid and outer bay stations all kind of fall together in the middle here. So let's take a closer look at those relationships. <clears throat> this cluster analysis dendrogram uh, shows the hierarchical relationships between stations. And I used a SIMPROF routine and primer to test for evidence of internal group structure. So statistically distinct groupings are represented by the solid black lines and red dash lines denote no further structure. So the SIMPROF identified seven statistically distinct groupings amongst the nutrient stations, uh, the river and offshore, uh, each group by themselves, East Bay surface and bottom were one group, and the East Bay bridge uh, station group by itself and Cap Point over here on the eastern side of the bay, grouped by itself. But then we see that these mid-bay areas of Dry Bar and Cap, um, Dry Bar and Mid-Bay, excuse me, group together. And then these outer bay, higher, usually higher saline stations, West Pass, Pilots Cove, and Nick's Hole, these all group together as well. <clears throat> so then I used a principal component analysis to determine which environmental variables were driving these statistical groupings. So PCA imposes 2D vectors over the MDS plot locations, and these vectors represent environmental components that show the percent variance explained by the environmental data. Um, and PC1 explains 49.9% of the variation. Um, it had a large association with ammonium, nitrite, and nitrate, um, and a large negative association with salinity. And then PC2 explained 43.1% of the variation. 
and it had a large negative association with chlorophyll and orthophosphate. And then uh, finally, um, so chlorophyll and salinity are strong determinants in relationships between the bay stations. So this figure shows a regression looking at the two with an exponential trend line. Uh, so over this nearly 20 year long data set, we consistently see the highest primary productivity in East Bay, closest to the river and distributary outflows. And as we move out into middle and outer bay stations and finally offshore, uh, primary productivity decreases. So East Bay is called the nursery of the bay. In addition to high primary productivity, it's an area utilized by many juvenile fish and macroinvertebrate species. <clears throat> so with the spatial relationships observed in the swamp environmental data in mind, we predicted we would see similar relationships represented in zooplankton communities. So the zooplankton sampling was initiated in 2016 uh, sampling events occur every season and sampling is paired with the nutrient and chlorophyll sampling so we can use that environmental data in our analyses. We do three one-minute surface tows at each swamp station um, except for that East Bay bottom station since it's already represented by East Bay surface and we have the two stations at one location. The samples are preserved immediately after collection. Uh, a subsample is used for um, ID by microscopy the copepods are identified to species and all everything else is uh, to major group um, and then the, the analysis is once again conducted in primer. So the results that I'm presenting today are from the spring 2018 quarter only because we're a little bit behind on our sample processing uh, but this table shows the percent total abundance each group makes up within the spring 2018 samples. So over 75 percent of the zooplankton abundance is copepods and the most co common copepod species in Apalachicola Bay is the Karshatanza, um, with Oithono colcarva being the second most abundant. And then uh, some of the other um, less abundant copepod species are listed here. Um, and we also see a lot of copepod noclei, barnacle noclei and cyprids, a little phytoplankton, and a little bit of a lot of other groups um, in the plankton. So this shade plot gives you an idea of the copepod species and groups dominating the samples. Um, so the stations on the top axis are arranged left, left to right in rough correlation with the north to south gradient of the bay. So the river is the first on the left, um, next the east bay stations, uh, mid to outer bay stations, and finally all the way on the right, Sykes cut off shore. And because the zooplankton was dominated by uh, several very abundant groups, I transform the data to downweight the dominant species and allow the rare space species to have more importance. And I placed an asterisk on the species lift on the left next to those most dominant species and groups. So this top line uh, is a Karshatanza. Oithona colcarva is this uh, dark line down here. And then the copepod noplii right here and uh, balanus noplii, barnacle noplii. <laughs> Oops. Can I go back one? Can I go back one slide, please? Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so looking, um, starting with the river, uh, overall in the river, the abundance is quite low um, and there's just not much in the river at all, uh, but the most common copepod is Oithona and there's also a lot of cladocerans in the river. Then next, moving to the East Bay stations. Um, East Bay is not very diverse. Copepods are dominated uh, by Akarshitans up here. Um, and we also see a lot of copepod and barnacle nuclei in the river. And then as you go from East Bay to Mid Bay and the Outer Bay stations, uh, Akarshitans is still abundant, but other copepods are increasing in abundance. Um, and we see higher biodiversity the further south in the bay we go. And uh, finally, offshore, we see very high biodiversity and acarsia are, are finally less abundant at the station. Um, so this metric MDS plot shows the relationships between zooplankton communities at these stations. Once again, we see a triangle with the river offshore 
and East Bay stations being the least similar. Um, so the 2D stress on this MBS is 0.15. This indicates an, it's an okay solution, but um, the substructure might benefit from looking at a 3D MDS instead. And the 3D MDS, which is not pictured, does have a better stress value of 0 0.09. So hopefully the relationships between stations will become clearer and the stress will improve when we have uh, more data to include on this analysis. So again, I used a cluster analysis and SIMPROF routine to test for evidence of internal group structure. And the SIMPROF test identified four statistically distinct groupings, the river, the East Bay stations, the East Bay surface and bridge group together here, offshore, um, but there was no evidence for additional structure in the spring 2018 data in any of the mid or outer bay stations. So to compare results between the two data sets, the nutrient and chlorophyll data showed seven distinct site groupings, which included evidence for separation of the mid bay stations and the higher salinity outer bay stations. Um, and PCA indicates these relationships were driven by nitrite and nitrate, ammonium, and salinity and chlorophyll. And we see a geographical gradient of that primary productivity and salinity from the river, uh, excuse me, from the East Bay to the Gulf of Mexico. And compared to the long-term nutrient data, we don't see the same statistical subgroupings uh, in the mid and outer base stations in the plankton data from spring 2018. But we do see the start of a pattern in uh, copepod species biodiversity with lower biodiversity found in areas of low salinity and high chlorophyll and higher biodiversity found in the reverse conditions. But it's worth noting that during the spring 2018 uh, sampling event, the physical conditions and the mid and outer bay stations were quite similar. So salinities in East Bay were low, five and six PSU, and then all of the mid and outer bay stations had quite a small range of 21 to 27 PSU and comparable nutrient levels. So we expect to see different patterns in zooplankton communities under wet versus dry conditions. Um, that might change those salinity regimes in the bay. Um, and Jennifer Putland, who uh, studied Apalachicola Bay zooplankton for her dis dissertation work, looked specifically at Akarshitanza and zooplankton productivity during different river flow conditions. Um, and she found that Akarsha, which are again the most common copepod species in the bay, experienced um, increased productivity rates at salinities of less than 20 PSU. And she concluded that reduced river flows, which increase the extent of high salinity waters in the bay, will lead to reduced higher trophic level productivity in the bay. So looking forward, um, as I mentioned, we have a backlog of zooplankton samples to be processed. So in 2020, we were lucky to purchase a flow cam, um, which we're using to move the sample processing away from traditional microscopy. So the flow cam takes images of particles as they flow through an imaging chamber, and then software uses digital recognition technology to match those images with libraries of identified particles. So I'm working on building out that process right now, and we're anticipating to have more zooplankton data for analysis soon. And when we do, we'll rerun the analysis, see if additional groupings emerge amongst those middle and outer bay stations, and we'll be able to look for seasonal patterns in abundance and distribution, and link those patterns to changes in physical conditions. Um, shameless plug, I'm looking for a summer intern to help uh, process samples with the FlowCam this summer. So if you have a student about to graduate, graduate or an undergraduate who might be interested, please contact me. And if I have time, I will take a few questions. Thank you. All right, Megan. Um, I did not see anything currently in the question box. Oh, Sandra Brooke just raised her hand. Uh, I'm gonna unmute her. She should be able to unmute herself now I am. and uh, ask a question. Yes, that was a great presentation, Megan. Very interesting and something that I've been sort of curious about for a while, um, how the flows influence the, the zooplankton. So I guess the next obvious step is to go up the trophic level and see whether the zooplankton populations are influencing the higher consumers. Do you have any um, plans to look at that and would you be interested in looking at it? Uh, sure, um, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, 
Aner does have a long-term Necton monitoring project that um, Jason Garwood will be talking about tomorrow. And um, Kira Allen, who's our uh, Margaret Davidson graduate fellow, um, is also working on um, a really neat EcoPath uh, food web project um, that, that ties into that. Um, and she'll also be talking about that um, tomorrow afternoon. So we are in some ways, um, but we're also always um, open to collaboration. So let's talk more. Okay, thank you, Megan. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see Andrew Gannon has his hand up. Yeah, I posted a question on the uh, Padlet, but I guess that didn't show up for you. So my question, Megan, is I didn't see the river station in the chlorophyll versus salinity figured. Is it, um, did I just miss it? No, you didn't, Andy. Um, <laughs> yeah, the river station is, the river, of course, it's, it's bringing nutrients into the bay, but the river is just doing its own thing. Um, so it really, it can, you know, we, 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 I think when the nutrients, when they get to the bay, um, you know, the flows slow down and that's when the primary productivity really starts happening. Um, so no, I don't include the river station. It wasn't in that figure, but I, I don't include it in that overall statement of the, the chlorophyll being highest in low salinity areas. Um, that's talking about in regards to East Bay and not the river. All right, um, and then uh, we have time for one more. Uh, Christy Lewis. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Lewis at University of Central Florida. I'm actually Kira Allen's major professor at UCF. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the question regarding the trophic linkages between the zooplankton and uh, uh, the necton. So Kira will absolutely be including these data if Megan would be happy to share them with her, of course. Um, and this is actually a, an innovation for um, these necton level food web models who generally clump zooplankton as one functional group. And what I see here is the opportunity to de-aggregate a functional group and actually look at the spatial temporal implications of these uh, data uh, on the upper trophic level. So um, I'm really excited to see these data, Megan, and I hope that, um, you know, you can work with Kira to kind of implement this into the feed web model. Um, thanks. Yeah, I think we can definitely make that happen. All right. That's okay. like it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Megan. That was wonderful. Um, next up, we're going to be joined by Dr. Nat. Next up, we'll be joined by Dr. Natalie Geyer. She's a, um, actually a former graduate research fellow here at the Reserve, so we're glad to have her back. She's a graduate of uh, FSU, and she'll be talking about small-scale flow. Um, it has a larger effect on phytoplankton communities in Apalachicola Bay. Welcome, Natalie. Okay, can you hear me now? Yay, yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. You know, I'm suspicious that it's that the AirPods are, um, I don't know, they get finicky when they're connected to Bluetooth over the computer. Yeah, sometimes it's it's a mystery. Well, take yeah. it away. <laughs> Here, I thought I, I had it sound tested and everything, and then it just stopped. So, great. Well, I'm glad we can all hear each other now. Um, yes. Again, um, good almost afternoon. Um, Natalie Geyer. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, Drove Balwada with the University of Washington, Elizabeth Simons, Kevin Spear, and Marcus Hoodle with Florida State University. And this is research that I conducted during graduate school while I was at FSU. Um, and we recently submitted a paper um, on this research titled, The Influence of Surface Water Flows on phytoplankton distribution in a shallow estuary. So the motivation for this research came out of a previous study conducted to characterize the spatial variability of phytoplankton in Apalachicola Bay. During this previous study, geo-referenced water quality data were collected along the transects shown in the figure using a flow-through sensor array called Dataflow. The data were collected at a spatial resolution of about 50 meters every two weeks for one and a half years totaling 30 sampling cruises. The salinity data collected during one sampling cruise is shown in the figure, 
and blue represents low salinity, so you can see where the river is pretty easily, and red represents high salinity. So this is, again, just one snapshot in time. So the spatial data for all 30 cruises was decomposed into four separate transects for analysis. Transect 1 tract, shown in the middle, went from the East Bay monitoring station to the dry bar monitoring station. And then water quality parameters were plotted by distance along these transects. So as shown in the bottom right graph, perchlorophyll A from one cruise is plotted along distance um, for transect 1. So using a peak analysis procedure, we then looked at this data um, to identify large and small scale features in the chlorophyll A distribution um, observed along the transect. Uh, a baseline, which is, is shown in green in the bottom right figure, was calculated to characterize broad scale features, and those tended to be about four to six kilometers wide. Um, the peaks above this baseline, which are not colored in, uh, represent smaller scale accumulations of phytoplankton biomass. And these small scale features were on average 1.2 kilometers wide and accounted for almost 10% of the biomass observed. So the small scale chlorophyll A peaks, which again represent patches of elevated phytoplankton concentrations, were frequently observed at salinity gradients, such as those present at the mouth of the river. The peaks also had characteristics such as width and edge gradients that were correlated with environmental data, um, such as wind speed and tidal phase. And these observations left us with additional questions about the temporal variability of phytoplankton patches and the processes controlling them, because the spatial data was more of a, a synoptic, a quasi-synoptic um, snapshot in time of, of the spatial distribution. And so the present lack of understanding of the temporal variability of estuarine phytoplankton accumulations and the processes controlling them limits uh, the phytoplankton quantification and the ecological conclusions that can be drawn from the patch observations. And since it's difficult to actually see and track a phytoplankton patch in real time in turbid waters that are common to Apalachicola Bay, we designed an observational study using dye as a mock phytoplankton patch to investigate these questions further. And this leads to our current study. The main goals of the current study were to determine the impact of estuarine currents on the lateral advection and dispersion of a dye patch on short time scales of minutes to hours, and then to use these findings to elucidate how physical processes influence phytoplankton distribution and patchiness. To reach these objectives, rhodamine WT dye was used to create a mock phytoplankton patch that could be tracked with drone photography. Two re dye releases were conducted, and those are shown on the, the map inset with the pink asterisks near Dry Bar on the west side of Apalachicola Bay. We also used a suite of instruments to measure the transport of the dye patches and the adjacent waters. So these included, let's see, we did water current measurements, um, over a period of four days using an AWAC, which is a, a bottom-mounted acoustic Doppler current profiler. And that was deployed near the dry bar station, as shown on the inset a map. And we also used Davis-style drifters that contain GPS units um, in an enclosed cylinder, as seen in the top right pictures. And these were about half a meter wide by half a meter deep. Wind and water levels were measured at the Apalachicola Mir dry bar monitoring station shown in the picture. And water quality parameters were measured from the boat using CTD cast and the, the data flow instrument. So in addition to new field measurements, we also analyzed some of the spatial data from the previous study outlined earlier using spectral analysis to calculate the power spectrum of a physical and biological tracer. The power spectrum indicates how much variability is contributed from different link scale flow features. And we found that the spectral behaviors of salinity, which is a passive tracer, and chlorophyll, which is a reactive tracer, were similar at link scales of 100 meters to three kilometers. And this suggests that at these link scales, the spatial structures of these two tracers are potentially stirred by similar dynamics. Um, and so we usually think of 
salinity at, at passive tracers being controlled mostly by physical processes, which would lead us to believe that at these link scales, at least, that chlorophyll is also being controlled dominantly by physical processes. So the AWAC data, this is the, the bottom mounted ADCP, showed typical tidal amplitudes of 20 to 40 centimeters per second. The different velocities at the different depths demonstrated a substantial amount of vertical shear present in the water column. And this can be seen in the two figures shown on the bottom right, um, which show the, the east-west, which is the U um, component, and the north-south, which is shown by V, um, the, the components of the velocity of the flow. And so the, the different the different velocities shown for the different layers in the water column, which is, are shown by the different colors, um, that's where we see the vertical shear, um, where these, you know, these two water layers are passing over each other at different speeds. So three different um, three drifters were released each day at the beginning of the flood tide and left out for about five hours. Um, in the figure of the one meter bathymetric contour is shown and individual drifter tracks are color-coded by day uh, with the drifter release points shown in, in the, the blue symbols. So the drifters tended to track with wind directions and had velocities ranging from three to 60 centimeters per second. And I'm not gonna go into the details of the calculations here, but data from the drifters were used to estimate diffusivity as well as kinematic properties of the horizontal flow. And so the, the characteristic magnitude of the edit diffusivity from the drifters was 0.1 meters squared per second at length scales of um, on the order of 100 meters. And the horizontal shear and strain rates were on the order of uh, 10 to the negative four to 10 to the negative three per second. And, and this latter rate is, is an important observation because these are two to three orders of magnitude um, greater stirring than what is typical in the ocean, open ocean um, strain rates, which is usually 10 to the negative six uh, per second. And this enhanced stirring underlines the difference between estuarine and open ocean settings critical for phytoplankton patch dynamics. Um, an independent calculation of eddy diffusivity was from the dye patches, ended up being a similar result um, on the same order of magnitude of 0.1 meters squared per second. And we'll look at the dye study, um, the dye patch evolution next. Okay, so the first dye patch was released and tracked for 52 minutes as it advected to the east at 30 centimeters per second. The wind during this time was blowing from the west at five to six meters per second. And the subsurface water layer flowed towards the northwest at 10 centimeters per second. The observations of this patch show how vertical shear can affect the horizontal distribution. Um, as we can see, the, the wind and the subsurface flows were um, opposing, and this ended up separating the layers of the dye patch, which we can see that the red, brighter pink colors visible at the surface are being were advected more to the east with the wind, and the bluish colors are dye that's been entrained in slightly deeper water, um, and the red wavelength has a have been absorbed by the water, so that's why we're seeing the blue, um, it was being advected more strongly with the subsurface currents. And so as the patch evolved, we saw that these layers, um, the surface and the subsurface layer, ended up separating and moving away from each other. And if we think about this in terms of a phytoplankton patch, you know, if the horizontal flow velocities are much faster than the active vertical phytoplankton movement, or the phytoplankton that can move, um, such shear processes could separate a, a well-confined phytoplankton patch into two different patches, thereby duplicating it, or also it could be um, moving it away from, could move an upper layer of phytoplankton away from grazing phytoplankton that might be, a, um, grazing zooplankton that might be approaching from below. And so a tidal front was also, oh, it went back. Can I go back one, please? Thank you. A tidal front um, was also present and shown by the dotted line. Um, and the salinity difference between the sides of this front were about four parts per thousand. 
And what we saw is that this demonstrated how density fronts can prevent dispersion across a frontal boundary, which caused steep concentrating, um, concentration gradients to form. Uh, and so as seen the, in the picture, the, um, the dye remained more concentrated against the front, which is the bottom side of the patch, and was dispersed more on the other side. And we were able to, to find examples of this in the spatial data from the other study that was mentioned earlier which is shown here in this figure where salinity is in blue and green is um, shows the chlorophyll A data with the peaks filled in with green. And the data was collected along a transect that went from the Apalachicola River to Dry Bar. Um, starting at the zero kilometer on this figure is about six kilometers upstream of the river mouth and uh, Dry Bar is at kilometer 19. And so in the red box we see an, a, is pointed out a chlorophyll A peak at the salinity gradient um, and the diffuse edge is on the marine side or the right side of the figure and um, the steeper chlorophyll A gradient it lines up with the, the steep salinity gradient. So the second dye patch evolved differently than the first. The black polygons in the figure represent the georectified drone images of a patch over time and the amount of time elapsed after the dye was released is shown beside each um, image in minutes and seconds. And so starting from the bottom picture, this is where the dye was being actively released and the drifters, one of which is, is in the close-up picture is easier to see, um, were good in situ spatial references um, for measuring distances from the drone photography. The middle picture is shortly after the dye patch, um, the dye was released to create the patch. And the top picture shows the patch, I think around 27 minutes um, in the, the corresponding figure after the dye was released and the the gap in between these is is just when the drone battery was being changed and so in this example the dye patch was affected to the northwest by current and elongated by wind blowing from um, the, the east southeast and in this case the the wind and the currents were going in similar directions and we can think about the differences between this patch and the previous one Whereas the previous one was up against the front and dispersed, this patch was stretched out by the wind and currents moving in similar directions, which deformed the patch into a filament or ribbon shape. And so the increasing surface area of the patch over time was mostly due to it getting longer in this example, as the width of the patch didn't increase much. We can see from the top graph, um, length increased from about 30 to 100 meters in 30 minutes, whereas the, the width stayed kind of similar bouncing back and forth between five and 10 meters. And the spreading rate of both of the dye patches ranged from about 0.1 to 0.7 meters squared per second, as mentioned earlier, which is similar to the diffusivity calculated from the drifters. Um, and this added confidence to our calculated diffusivities at these link scales. So to conclude, um, the results of this study suggest that the small scale flow environment in estuaries can be pivotal to the in controlling the development or decay of phytoplankton communities, particularly in a system like Apalachicola Bay where the basin flushes on timescales of days. The current amplitudes of about 30 centimeters per second imply that in a rising tide, material in the bay can make an excursion of about four meter or four kilometers in the flow direction. And this is about one third of the, the width of the bay um, which emphasizes the role that tides play on lateral mixing. Phytoplankton could be in this time period transported into and out of regions favorable for growth and population drawdown as the parameters controlling growth and loss are often unevenly distributed in estuaries due to local features such as bathymetry and river um, freshwater input. We also saw that aerial imagery of the dye patches provided valuable qualitative insight into the complex interactions of physical processes controlling the distribution and mixing of water masses and the phytoplankton within. In this study, we observed two different physical processes with opposite effects. The mixing processes um, can deform and separate patches, producing filaments and diffuse patch boundaries, whereas fronts can limit the across front direction um, mixing and cause sharp patch boundaries. And from a temporal standpoint, the study found enhanced stirring in the estuary compared to open oceans. Um, and the, the time scales of the dispersion were, were 
faster than typical phytoplankton growth, which is usually on the order of um, hours to more like days. And uh, these dye patches were transported and dispersed on timescales more like minutes to hours. So the formation and dispersal of smaller scale patches will likely influence larger scale spatial features, but the interactions of these different spatial scales will require further investigation. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, all the help that the, the staff there at the Apalachical Anir have been to me over the years, and in particular for this study, um, for, for taking us out on the boat and, and helping us uh, get all, of, all the logistics squared away in the field. Um, and also to Mike Wetz, who was my co-advisor and uh, while I was at FSU, and also to all the folks from FSU that helped us with the field work and the deployment of these mini instruments. And with that, if there's any questions, if we have time, I'd be happy to take them. Um, yeah, I have uh, one question that came in on the Padlet. Um, has anyone looked into the stoichiometry of the phytoplankton masses? Could we clarify into the of the phytoplankton masses, like the, the patches? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Um, probably not, um, because the the research that's gone into to looking at patchiness in um, estuaries is is fairly limited. There's been a lot of studies that look at physical processes and you know, a decent amount of studies that have looked at uh, phytoplankton distribution, but bridging the gap between them is um, a little less well researched. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Lynn Wilder wanted to know, um, are there applications to monitoring red tide with this approach? You know, I mean, that's a good question that as we understand the the dynamics of these phytoplankton patches better in different systems that, you know, the, the applications beyond that um, could really help inform us of, of their dynamics. And, and in the case of red tide, you know, thinking of it in terms of smaller scales, what we know about dinoflagellate behavior and um, swimming migration, um, and putting that into context of how they're being pushed around by physical forces that may either, you know, disperse and break apart or wash out um, a potential bloom versus congregating them in an area where there are favorable conditions for growth. Um, you know, I definitely think there could be applications, though it might be site specific. Great, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Natalie. That was wonderful. And we are now going to take a break for lunch. Be sure to check thank out you. the Padlet and uh, the, the bios and the, the upcoming afternoon agenda and tomorrow's agenda. So we will uh, convene again at 1 p.m. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. Let people sign back on. I wanted to say an extra thank you to all of our speakers this morning. I thought everything, they did an excellent job. We're still working out some kinks on the, the technology side of things, but thank you for everyone for your patience as we work through this and um, hopefully make this successful. So I see that it's one o'clock. And uh, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker is Dave Gandy from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And this afternoon, Dave is gonna talk about Florida's fisheries independent monitoring program in Apalachicola Bay and Red Drum Nursery habitat use. So Dave, if you're there, if you'd like to put on your camera. Hey, good afternoon, can you hear me? I can, I'm gonna take okay, it away. Great. Unfortunately, I don't have a working camera, but hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, no, you sound, you so, sound yeah, great. Thanks, Dave. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to be invited to come speak. Lots of great talks, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the talks this afternoon as we continue. Um, so yeah, so the uh, again, my name is Dave Gandy. I'm a research administrator for the Apalachicola Bay Fin Lab uh, with FWC. Um, let's see how to 
transition to the slide here. Okay, here we go. So uh, basic general framework of my talk today is going to first provide a uh, just a real general overview of the FIM program here in Apalachicola Bay. I'm then gonna highlight the use of some of our data to look at nursery habitat use of red drum. And then if we have some time at the end, I'll provide a quick summary and, and some future directions uh, we wanna take um, the red drum uh, information I'm gonna present. So for those that may not be familiar with FWC's uh, FIM program, so Apalachicola FIM is part of a much larger uh, statewide program within the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Uh, we began in 1989 uh, out of Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor, and then we progressively expanded um, to now seven labs throughout the state here in the black boxes in this slide. Um, Apalachicola Bay FEM Lab started in 1998. And we started collecting year-round data on fish and select invertebrates in 1999. So our program objectives focus on three main areas. So we use this information to address single species management issues by providing data and analyses of that data on distribution and abundance and occurrence of recreationally important species, along with the collection of rele relevant life history data like age and growth and reproduction uh, that are needed for single species assessments. Um, uh, but we also take a more holistic approach uh, in our sample collection and design. So we want to be able to provide data for multi-species ecosystem-based management and modeling. Um, and we, uh, and lastly, if I get the, there we go. Um, we also want to develop baseline data needed to understand how emerging issues impact our fisheries and the habitat that, that supports them. Things like large-scale disturbances like hurricanes or climate change, uh, even changes in fishing activities or changes in regulations issues concerning fish health. So to meet these objectives, we sample every month year-round using a multi-year stratified random sampling design. I'm just going to provide a very general overview of our methods, but you can get with me later if you have questions about more details on it. So each month, uh, the same number of samples are randomly selected based on available habitat and depth strata in each of the zones shown in this map here. We have two zones in the bay and one in the lower river. Um, and each month, a new randomization to samples are selected, uh, and this occurs year-round, 12 months. We use three gear types, including two different size uh, seines and an otter trawl, so we can um, collect an accurate representative sample of the entire fish community and some select invertebrates, not all of them, but some. Um, uh, we use a 70-foot small mesh seine to target small necton in shallow water, we use a larger 600-foot large mesh stain to target um, larger necton in shallow water, and the 20-foot trawl um, is used to target uh, small to medium necton in deeper habitats. Just to give you an idea of the spatial extent and the number of samples we collect, this map here shows our 2019 sampling effort. Uh, the different colored dots represent the different gear types that I just briefly mentioned before. Um, so we collect 70 samples a month. This comes out to 840 samples annually. And to give you an idea about uh, some of our just basic catch information, in 2019, we caught over 173,000 uh, animals uh, uh, represented by almost 200 taxa. In addition to identifying all the species we collect um, and counting and measuring them, we also collect the number of habitat and water quality metrics of each of these sampling sites. And this data we collect is integrated with other FWRI data sources like our fisheries dependent monitoring to provide biological information used by FWC uh, and our interstate commissions and federal councils that are uh, in charge of managing Florida's marine fisheries. So that is just really a, a very, very general overview of our program. We could spend a whole talk on it. Uh, if not longer. Um, if you have any questions about details of some of the stuff I've kind of gone over quickly, just feel free to get with me later. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the use of some of them's data to look at nursery habitat use of an estuarine dependent sport fish, red drum, in Apalachicola Bay. And I, I want to acknowledge my co authors as well. This is a paper we hope to have out this summer Bob Gorecki, Tim McDonald, and Kevin Thompson. 
So just to give you a little bit of background, if you're not familiar with the life cycle red drum, uh, adult red drum will congregate near bay mouse inlets near Thor continental shelf waters from about mid-August to late November to spawn. The eggs and larvae are then carried by tides and currents into the estuarine uh, waters. Um, growth is rapid as juveniles. They reach about 13 and a half inches by the end of their first year. Um, from ages one to four, they disperse across a range of estuarine habitats, and by age five, most have reached maturity. So what we know about nursery habitat use for red drum is that they tend to be habitat generalists. They're found to use a wide variety of estuarine nursery habitats. Uh, oyster bars, flooded salt marshes, seagrass flats, lower salinity backwaters, to name a few. Um, however, we've also found from other studies that the value of those nursery habitats um, uh, differs across those different habitat types. So there's been studies that have shown differences in density and survival um, among those different habitat types. We also know that red drum nursery use varies among different estuarine systems. So for our study, our objectives are we want to identify where the, the nursery ground hotspots are, so to speak. We then want to look at what environmental conditions may uh, affect nursery quality. And we want to understand how habitat use and their preference for certain environmental conditions shift as they're growing during that first, first year, which is very fast. So I'm going to just kind of gloss over the, the stats methodology here, um, but we're using two different methods. Um, we're using a spatially explicit hotspot analysis to identify where the nursery habitats are located in the bay. Um, this is a, a basically a test for spatial autocorrelation that is looking for significant clusters of samples that have higher or lower abundance than expected by chance. So the, the red the red shaded dots are what we're focused on here that would indicate where where the primary use of, of uh, nursery habitat is. We're also using uh, classification and regression trees to determine nursery quality. So it, essentially it, it, it generates a decision, a decision tree, excuse me, um, to determine what environmental variables best predict the occurrence of red drum. In this case, we're using presence absence data. And we put a, a number of categorical and continuous variables into these uh, regression tree models that I'll go over in the results. Um, so for all analysis, both the spatial and regression tree analysis, we partition the data into four size groups to account for ontogeny during that first year. So the first size group we're calling newly settled young of years. These are fish that are less than 50 millimeters standard length. Our second uh, size class we're calling early stage young of years. These are 51 to 100 millimeters standard length. Our late stage young of years are, are 101 to 200 millimeters standard length. And our fourth group we're calling transitional age one fish. These are fish that are um, uh, 201 to 300 millimeters standard length. They're either approaching the end of age zero or transitioning to age one and some maybe even age one in that size class. Okay, um, so this next figure is showing the timing of peak recruitment when it occurs in Apalachicola Bay, okay? Um, so um, we have this relative abundance in percent on the y-axis, month on the x-axis. I wanna note here that uh, for those first three size groups I mentioned before, we're considering peak recruitment months, we're defining that as months where uh, relative abundance is greater than 5%. That's just our, our own criteria for defining peak recruitment. So our first size group, newly settled young of years, um, enter in the system and peak uh, in the bay between October and February, uh, followed by November through April for our early stage young of years that are 51 to 100 millimeters standard length. Through July, by the time they grow to the, the late stage young of year phase, which are again, 101 to 200 millimeters, and transitional age one ones um, uh, consist of fish approaching the end of their first year of life and those transitioning to age one. Um, uh, so we consider them fully recruited to the estuary across all, all months at this size. And these windows that I've showed you, these recruitment windows, are also the, the time span at which 
the, our analysis is conducted for each of those five schools. Okay, going on to the next slide here. All right, so um, the next four slides are going to highlight our hotspot analysis results uh, separately for each uh, four size group. So we'll have four maps here to show. Um, and again, these are identifying where the nursery habitats are located within Apalachicola Bay. This first map is showing results from our stylus, uh, excuse me, smallest size group, newly settled young of years, less than 50 millimeters standard length. Um, for this size group, we found hot spots located in two main regions of the bay, including uh, within and directly surrounding East Bay to the north, and hot spots widely centered around St. George Island to the south. What's interesting to note um, here about these two main regions is that if East Bay is uh, characterized by lower salinity and low to no SAV, where St. George Island has higher salinity and high SAV. And these characteristics I mentioned because they will come uh, important in validating our decision tree results a little later. As we move to our next size group, uh, this map is showing our early stage young of years. Um, within and directly outside of East Bay still remains the primary nursery hotspot region in the bay. And um, note the lack of hotspots around St. George Island where we previously observed them in the smaller size group. Okay, as we move to our third size group, again, these are, uh, we're calling late stage young of years. Um, East Bay, again, continues to remain the primary nursery area in the bay. Um, but we also see additional hotspots show up in the west of East Bay along the north shore of Apalachicola Bay proper and a few in the western edge of St. Vincent Sound. So as Red Drum moved to our largest size class that we're looking at here, uh, our final size group, transitional age one fish, um, East Bay is still a nursery hotspot area, but the size of their coverage shrinks a little bit. Um, we also see hotspots in St. Vincent Sound uh, expand compared to the previous size, and we see an expansion of hotspots to uh, back to St. George Island, where initially uh, we saw them for that smaller, smaller size class. Oh, I went the wrong way here. Bear with me. Okay. So the next four slides um, are going to show results of our um, regression tree analysis for. Again, for each of the size groups separately. Here we're using presence absence data to identify what environmental variables best predicted occurrence of young of years. So um, how you interpret these trees is, I'll try to do my best here to explain this. So each labeled box uh, represents a decision node in the tree uh, for variables that came out as important in our model. So we start at the top with the root node, and that represents the entire sample population. And we travel down the tree until we reach the terminating node, which is associated with the final prediction. So the dark bars uh, at each of those terminating nodes represent the percent of samples that red drum occurred in. And I've highlighted uh, in the results here in a second, you'll see um, the best predictors are highlighted in green. Um, and I should note that we define the best predictors of occurrence um, here, our criteria was where the final nodes were at least double this overall proportion positive for each model, which is listed at the top left corner of each graph. Um, uh, so for our smallest size group, newly settled young of years, our best predictor is in green again. Um, we see shoreline habitat with greater than 30% SAV cover, followed by shoreline habitat with less than 30% cover and salinity less than 21.7%. Uh, parts per thousand nest predicts their occurrence in this case. As we move to our next size group, these are early stage young of years, again 51 to 100 millimeter standard length. Salinity again um, is one of the best predictors here, uh, but it's less than seven parts per, per, per thousand along shoreline habitat um, in this case. So as we move on to our third size group, late stage young of years, uh, salinity still remains uh, to be one of the most important predictors of nursery habitat use um, at values less than 12 and a half. <clears throat> and then as we reach our last size group, these again are transitional H1 fish. Uh, salinity still continues to be one of the best predictors of nursery habitat use, less than 26 
0.8 parts per thousand, and we see slightly higher percent occurrence where bottom types are either mixed, mud, or contain artificial structure, followed by sand bottom types with temperatures greater than 18.1 degrees C. Um, so I want to note that across all four size, size groups, um, how the breakpoints for salinity have changed from our smallest size group where it was less than 21.7, followed by our two intermediate size groups um, at less than seven and less than 12 and a half percent or uh, parts per thousand respectively, and, and then became much higher um, as we reached uh, transitional age one fish. So, transition here. Okay, um, so this next graph is showing salinity on the y-axis within our hot and cold spots. And we have each of our four size groups here on the x-axis in millimeters standard length. Um, so we, we wanted to look at the salinity within our hot spots and see how they changed as sort of a way of validating our tree results. And again, um, uh, our tree results was looking at occurrence, our hot spot analysis was looking at abundance. Um, so this, uh, um, in this figure here, the trend in salinity matches well with our tree prediction, starting out in, uh, at A here, uh, higher mesohaline salinities, then in that next size group, um, dropping off to lower salinities, and then steadily increasing the polyhaline salinities as they reach age one fish. So it seems to, you know, agree, it, it agrees with what we found in our previous results. We know that in East Bay, uh, where we observed the majority of our um, uh, nursery ground hotspots, that we do see a lot of variation in uh, salinity. Uh, this is average water column salinity on the Y, followed by time on the X. So we see variation within and among years. And so going forward, um, we we want to better understand how salinity regime shifts may impact the extent of nursery ground use and the habitat that they use, and and ultimately how that's going to uh, impact survival and recruitment to the fishery and the adult adult spawning stock. So real quick, brief summary here. So uh, our red drum analysis identified uh, the timing of recruitment within the bay, and we identified regions that support um, uh, are supported as nursery ground and the conditions uh, that best predict their current. So red drum, again, preferred lower salinity back, backwaters, but gradually shifted from mesohaline to polyhaline waters as they reached stage one. And I'm almost done here. So going forward, there's a couple of things that we want to do. Um, one, we'd like to be able to determine the contribution of Apalachicola Bay nurseries to um, northeastern Gulf of Me Mexico red drum stock. Um, we also want to look at the relationship between freshwater inflow and the size of those hotspots, and again, how that affects survival. Uh, and then we want to do this for a whole host of estuarine-dependent species that use uh, some of these same areas as, as nursery ground. Um, and with that, that concludes my talk. Hopefully I'm not over time and I'll take questions if there's time. Thanks so much, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, we're just a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to ask folks that if they have questions, either put them in the, in the uh, questions box or on the Padlet, and uh, we'll make sure that, uh, that Dave sees them. And uh, I'd like to transition to our next presentation. Our next speaker will be Andy Gannon from Birmingham Southern College, and his presentation will be monitoring impacts of freshwater flow and salinity on the blue crab populations in Apalachicola Bay. So Andy, hopefully you're ready to go. If you have your camera ready and... That's the third time I've unmuted myself. It's working now, great. And my slides. There Just we go. Second. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is a, a work in progress, and it's actually in, in the early stages of progress. So my research is part of the Apalachicola River Slough Restoration Project. This is a project that was initiated by the uh, Riverkeeper, and it was funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation uh, through a large grant. Uh, partners include Aner and the University of Florida. 
The goal is to restore some of the river estuary um, hydrological connectivity that's been lost to sediment fill. And as you can see in this picture, that sandbank right there is sediment that's filled in uh, the mouth of a, one of the sloughs. So Spiders Cut and Douglas Slough are gonna be dredged to remove this sediment. And the project is gonna include uh, monitoring subsequent changes in hydrology, water chemistry, and biota, and comparing them to what uh, conditions were beforehand. Uh, the connectivity needs to be restored because uh, the decreased flow into the Apalachicola River and Bay from the Flint and Chattahoochee Rivers is blamed for the collapse of the oyster fishery, as most of you know, and um, that decreased freshwater flow leads to high salinities in the Bay. Okay, I am not in control of which slide we're looking at here. Good. Hang on just one second, Andy. Um, it's got a bit of a delay, so if it doesn't click through the first time, just give it a, a few seconds and then try it one more time. But um, is this the right slide? Yes, this is. And so I just need to click to move to the next slide, right? Right. Yeah, click and then make them deliberate so it doesn't uh, <laughs> get too yeah. many ahead. Okay. So we expect to see an increased delivery of freshwater nutrients to the East Bay and a change in water quality. Uh, increased productivity, increased submerged aquatic. Okay, I don't know what I'm, this is Dave's slide here. <laughs> there we go. Um, and we might see a de an increase in the blue crab population and a decrease in the uh, barnacles that attach to the blue crabs. So salinity is super important to blue crabs. It affects their um, life cycle and migration patterns. But the juveniles and adults are excellent osmoregulators. Um, they can live in hypersaline lagoons and they can live in freshwater, but the larvae need just about full strength seawater. So the life cycle starts with larvae in open ocean waters as plankton, developing into the next stage larva megalope as they migrate into estuaries and migrating or morphing into juveniles as they migrate upward in estuaries. And the adult males and females spend a lot of their time in the upper reaches of estuaries in relatively low salinity. And females, after they mate, migrate downstream to higher salinity to release their larvae into uh, high concentration uh, seawater. This has been demonstrated for a number of different estuaries. So my research contribution uh, to the project is to establish the background population size and distribution by age class and gender and relative to salinity for the blue crabs and to look at the infestation levels of barnacles and how that relates to salinity. And monitoring of these things is going to continue after the dredging for a number of years. Now for the blue crab populations in the past, I have several sources of data the um, Florida Freshwater, Florida Fish and uh, Wildlife Conservation Commission uh, records commercial landings for Franklin County. Um, so the annual blue crab harvest day is available online. And this goes back to 1985, so it's the oldest source, but it's not the best source of data because it includes only what's reported to uh, the FWC and what, uh, and only adults. So I also have data from the Ainer uh, Fixation Trawling Program from 2000 to the present. And you, if you heard the previous talk, you heard Dave talk about the FWC Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program, um, which I'm glad he explained. So, okay, there we go. Okay. There. So the Ainer sampling program involves otter trawls from nine to 12 stations to identify and count fish and selected invertebrates, including blue crabs. And there's data from monthly trawls from 2000 to 2012, and then quarterly from 2014 to the present. And there's water quality measurements, and you can see these trawling stations. Um, if you saw Megan's uh, presentation earlier, it's the same stations or some of the same stations. So I greatly appreciate the help of Aner, and since I'm running low on time, I don't have time to go into great detail on that. So I appreciate 
how they've graciously let me go out on the boat with them um, and collect crabs to look for barnacle parasites on them. I've also been fortunate to uh, been allowed to go out with the FWC FEM program, which I won't go into as much detail as I plan to since Dave has just uh, so well explained that program. Um, so they've also let me collect crabs and look for uh, barnacles on those crabs. And I appreciate greatly the time I've spent with them and uh, the help they've given me on my research. So looking at the data, we have the uh, Franklin County blue crab harvest right here from 1985 to um, 2020. And um, the blue line here shows the number of pounds. So that's the annual harvest. And you can see a lot of um, fluctuations, almost uh, oscillations here. Um, and the dotted blue line shows the trend showing a gradual decrease in the pounds of blue crabs that are harvested. And the catch per unit effort shows a lot of fluctuations as well. Um, one thing to note is a big a spike in both in 2006. But otherwise, the two don't seem to be that well linked. Um, and they don't, neither one of them serves as a great index of what the population of crabs actually is because there's so many other factors that affect the harvest and um, the catch per unit effort. So for the ANER data, we have, again, the years on our x-axis from 1998 to 2020. So our blue line shows the catch per unit effort. And I've combined all the crabs and all salinities here, although uh, we can separate them out. And again, lots of uh, fluctuations. And the trend line here showing an R squared of 0 0.0008 and a slope of negative um, 0.01 tells us that it's, it's no trend. It's not going up or down. It's roughly stable. I threw in some environmental factors that might be thought to have uh, an effect on the population. So we see a couple of hurricanes in 2004 and 2005, and we see a big increase in population. So that's that 2006 increase that we saw in the FWC is also shown here as like the highest um, catch per unit effort that we find. Um, I've got the drought from 2011-2012 showing us very low, so those kind of make sense. Another hurricane showing increases. I put on the deep water horizon here. Um, I don't think it would have any reason to uh, um, affect the crabs in Apalachicola, but if anybody has any ideas about a way it would, um, I'd love to hear it. So this is a huge sample size. This is almost 10,000 crabs. So this is the FIM data. And again, we've got uh, the years on our x-axis. We have a few more years because this started in 1998 and goes, but we only go up to 2017 because um, we don't have the data yet. It's not available yet after uh, QA and QC, uh, but we'll get that. Again, a large sample size. This is almost 24,000 uh, crabs. And our catch per unit effort, shown here on our y-axis, and again, combining crabs of all ages and sizes and from all salinities. And this has a lot of similarities with the ANER data, as you might expect, which suggests these are both relatively good indices of what the population is. And you can see this same peak in 2006, and you can see this same drop right after the 2011-2012 drought in the population here. I've also put down the mean annual discharge from the Woodruff Dam here to show the freshwater input into the system. And you can see the fluctuations in here. You can see the drought showing up here in 2011 and 2012. But except for that drought and the subsequent drop in the population or a catch per unit effort as a stand in for the population the next year, there doesn't seem to be a lot of synchrony between these two curves. Uh, some people argue that it's better to look at the low flow months than the overall flow since a single tropical storm or tropical depression can have a huge effect on the annual flow, um, but um, not affect having months of drought. So this is the same data as far as the catch per unit effort, this blue line and the bars at the bottom show us the number of months of low flow, that's less than 15,000 
cubic feet per second, which is thought by some to be a, a cutoff point for um, fresh water actually reaching into the bay. And um, for instance, in 2012, that drought year, the, there's 11 months of low flow in that particular year and, and a subsequent drop in the population. The trend line here for the catch per unit effort has a slight increase over time, but uh, not a major factor. So our population size preliminary take home lesson is that uh, so far the populations have fluctuated greatly with environmental events, sometimes logically and sometimes seemingly stochastically. What I didn't point out in those figures is that juveniles make up the bulk of the population. And so they're the driver for most of what you saw in those figures, um, the adult population tends to trend with the juveniles rather than showing a lag, which is interesting and, and I need to explore that more. Um, and we still have some more data to collect. So now I've taken catch per unit effort data and arranged it by the salinity from which the crabs were taken. And I've got the juveniles, and uh, uh, first the blue line is all crabs, and you can see highest at the low salinity, decreasing uh, throughout with a slight bump at the next to highest category. I, I should have pointed out I've got five part per thousand blocks of salinity along my x-axis. And the juvenile follows the all because, as I said, the juveniles make up most of the population. There's a difference between the males and females, and uh, they're both highest in the low salinities, but the males actually go up from the lowest to the next to lowest salinity, and then you see that gradual decline, and, and not uh, many crabs, or not, sorry, low catch per unit effort in the highest salinities. When we look at the FIM data arranged the same way, so again, we've got our blocks of salinity across the x-axis, and our uh, catch per unit effort adjusted for the crabs, we see that um, we don't start off at the lowest salinity with our highest numbers. Those are in the second lowest salinity box. Um, but then we have decreases, not as continuous as uh, in the other uh, figure. Our females, adult females, peak a little bit uh, higher in salinity, and then they have a second peak at the next to highest box, and they end up at a much higher level um, in the highest salinity, as we might have expected uh, to see in the other graph, because if females are migrating to the high salinity water to spawn, then we would expect the females to be represented in the high salinity waters. Um, we didn't catch a lot of sponge crabs, females with eggs, and the Migration goes to outside of the estuary, and the sampling by both Aner and FEM stops in the estuary and doesn't go outside the estuary. So there may be a lot of females that were missed because of that. So we do see the crabs predominantly in the lower salinity portions. Um, we see, uh, we would expect that if we um, keep increasing the salinity of the estuary, we'll see a shift in the crab population distribution. And if we alleviate that increasing salinity in any way, that will also create a shift in the crab population distribution. Now, barnacles love to attach to crabs, and Octolasmus mulleri has evolved so that it's found only in the gill chamber or on the gills of crabs. Uh, Kilonibia will attach to crabs, it'll also attach to turtles, but there's a lot more blue crabs than turtles in Apalachicola. There's an internal barnacle that parasitizes crabs, and uh, we looked for them and we did not find any of those. We also got some crabs, in addition to the Aner and uh, Fem crabs, from a local crabber who has traps right at one of the Aner logging stations, and I appreciate uh, his help along with the other crabbers who've uh, shared their knowledge with us. So the barnacles attached to the gills, and you can see in the picture to the right here, a lot of barnacles attached to gills of a blue crab that's been taken out of the crab, and they can harm the host by blocking water flow through their gill chamber. Um, the crabs respond physiologically to the barnacles' presence by elevating heart rate, ventilation rate, um, and don't show much other uh, evidence of, of damage, but a blue crab can have as many as 610 
uh, barnacles in its one in its gill chambers, and that can cause problems. So if a crab's stressed by high temperature and immersion, it's much more likely to die from that if it's uh, infested with the barnacles. Now the barnacles, both larvae and adult, are not able to osmoregulate like the crabs are. So what we've seen for the uh, Apalachicola infestation rate is relatively low numbers. We'll compare it to other places on the next slide. So Octolasmus, 12% infestation rate, uh, Chelonibia, 10%. And when we separate into males and females, we see uh, about the same. Um, we see a lot of uh, Cohen infestation where they have both of these barnacles on them. So we can compare this. Apalachicola is across the top. And it's the widest range of salinities where a study like this has been done. But if you drop down one to Seahorse Key off the coast of Cedar Key, you see much higher infestation rates and a big skewing between males and females and the salinity never got lower than 22 there. Um, for uh, Beaufort Inlet in North Carolina, dropping down near the bottom, we see much higher infestation rates and males and females about equal. Grand Isle, Louisiana, we see much higher infestation rates with females infested much more. But we have two samples from low salinity waters. So from the Chesapeake Bay, we've got 1% uh, and 2% for males and females. And the infested ones were only in water that was greater than 23%. Um, at the lower salinities, is, um, there were no infestations. So I made a figure showing the salinity range, again, our five part per thousand boxes and the decreasing trend as you move to the lower salinities and a binomial regression indicating that they're significantly correlated. We see some barnacles here though, and that was surprising because before that we had not seen them in the low salinity. But the thing was, these barnacles were actually dead. When a barnacle cements itself to the crab, it stays cemented even if the crab dies. So in the next slide here, I took out crabs that had dead barnacles in them and counted them as not infested. And now we get an even stronger correlation of barnacle infestation uh, with salinity. So the barnacle infestation can be massive. We found in the newest study, we found 636 barnacles in one crab. And we found gravid barnacles on juvenile crabs, which is something that hasn't been published before. And we found dead barnacles still attached to the crab gills, which hadn't been published before either. And so this is support for the hypothesis that crabs moving into fresh water decreases the potential harm from commensal barnacles. And I don't know if I have any time for questions, although I would love to have some. Thank you so much, Andy. Oh my gosh, so much good, so much information there. Wow, um, so much to take in. Um, I don't believe there were any questions. Um, just a, a comment from Steve Lightman that he says um, he considers 15,000 cubic feet, feet per second is closer to median flow as opposed to low flow. So that might be just kind of a, a subjective, I don't know, you all can, can talk about it offline. But um, if you do have questions for Andy, please um, put them in the chat or on the Padlet and we will do our best to direct them directly to him. I uh, would like to move to our next speaker. And uh, we're gonna shift for the rest of the afternoon talking about uh, oysters. So um, next up we have Carrie Jones. Uh, Carrie is at the, the Shellfish Lab, uh, Florida Department of Ag Agriculture and Consumer Services. And uh, today she's gonna be talking about shellfish aquaculture in Apalachicola Bay. So thanks so much, Carrie. Uh, while we're waiting for the slides to get pulled up, uh, my name is Carrie Jones with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, also just known as FDACS because it's kind of a mouthful, uh, Division of Aquaculture. And I've been with the division for nine years. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about shellfish aquaculture, giving you a brief overview of our process and then new leases in Apalachicola Bay and around the state and some new technology we're integrating. There we go. Uh, this map here on the left shows the amount of aquaculture certificates per county. The red county is Levy over in Cedar Key and is our clam hotspot. 
Then the two orange counties over here in the panhandle are mostly uh, oyster leases and they're Wakulla and Franklin counties. Wakulla up here to the north uh, has two high density lease areas, which we call aquaculture use zones or AUZs. And there are 61 parcels over there, all growing oysters. Alligator Harbor is part of Franklin County, which we've just recently added 21 new parcels to the existing AUZ, making it 67 leases. And they're growing clams and oysters. And then the new AUZ, which we just added in Apalachicola Bay, which I will talk about a little bit later. Florida is the biggest ornamental producer in the nation, but you can see from this pie graph uh, that the shellfish is not too far behind at 17%. So the division oversees the application, execution, and compliance of the submerged land leases by assessing and identifying new areas, permitting BMPs, and inspections and audits. To date, Florida has 784 active leases covering 2,795 acres. So for those who may not be familiar with our process, here's just a little flow chart uh, to show that it's pretty streamlined. Um, it can take six months or more depending on comments. Once they apply, we send the location off for a title determination with DEP. If there are no encumbrances, I go out and physically assess the site to ensure there is no critical habitat, such as oyster reefs, seagrass, or hard bottom. We also look to see if there will be any navigation issues as well as any other conflicts with recreational or commercial uses. Then my report is sent off for public noticing and local, state, and federal review. If there are no objections, then it goes to the Florida governor and cabinet. And if approved, the applicant must get a survey. And once that's submitted, it is finalized and executed. And if it's a water column lease, we also apply for a patent uh, or a navigational permit with the US Coast Guard. So then I will then go out and conduct inspections annually to enforce the marking requirements. All AUZs or individuals have corner markers with their corner direction and lease identification number. Uh, water column leases must have these large yellow US Coast Guard markers you see here on the right. Um, and then the lantern also on the top so you can see it at night. Then the interior poles are usually just a PVC post and require international orange tape as well as their corner direction and lease number. The general public is able to navigate within and around these leases and there are 25 foot easements in between each parcel. The markers, gears and crops are private property so it is illegal to damage them. So just be aware of these water column leases when you're fishing or boating near them. We also conduct audits um, annually to ensure effective cultivation, which they must plant 70,000 oysters per acre per year or 100,000 clams per acre per year, depending on the lease type. So the leaseholder is also responsible for marking their gear and the collection and proper disposal of all gear, including when dislodged from a storm. The gear can get pretty expensive, so they definitely want to mark their gear so they can potentially get it back if it ever gets washed up on the shore. But we also look for these tags during our routine inspections, as well as conduct shoreline surveys after major storms. They usually use these bright orange or yellow plastic or metal tags with their name and number. So if you ever find aquaculture gear on the shoreline, you can look for these tags and call them to come and retrieve. If no tags are visible, you can call us and we can try to help find the owner. We're also about a year in with a dumpster project over in Cedar Key and have collected over 82,000 pounds and nearly 5,800 in cubic feet in cover nets and clam bags so far. We're also working with John Brucker with the Aquatic Preserve to do a shoreline cleanup in March over in Alligator Harbor as well as potentially a kiosk for education and awareness near that AUZ for aquaculture debris as well. And in relation to the potential cover net debris issue over in Cedar Key, we're also working on some research for a biodegradable cover netting for the clam industry. This cover net is pretty much one and done once they've used it, about a one to two year lifespan. So with the help of some USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture funds, we're working with an engineer at FSU to develop an affordable alternative to these plastic cover nets. They're still in the engineering phase, but the base material is lignin, 
which is a tree pulp waste product. And if you remember those old school cheap brown uh, paper towels in elementary school, it's that is lignin. It can be mass produced with without new machinery and field trials will be conducted soon in Cedar Key. Also some other cool new technology on the marine debris front. We just started conducting bottom surveys around the leases using a Humminbird Helix 10 size scan sonar. You can see this image from a recent survey where you can clearly see some oyster cages and even a long line on the bottom. We will also be able to use this machine to quickly cover large areas, not have to rely on diving or snorkeling in bad water, water clarity conditions, and great for being able to scan lots of acreage at once for potential new lease areas. We have also just integrated a new interactive map on our website where you can see all the lease parcels, vacant and occupied, along with our shellfish harvesting areas. If you just go to our main page, fdax.gov, and then click on divisions or offices, and then aquaculture, you will see a link to this map. You can zoom into specific areas and see where they're open and conditions for closure like I have pulled up right here. These blue areas are approved and they're only closed under emergency conditions such as hurricanes or sewage spills. And then these green areas are conditionally approved areas and they close on certain conditions such as river or rainfall. Then the orange is restricted and red is prohibited and no shellfish may be harvested from those areas at any time. Leases for consumption are only able to be to go into the approved and conditionally approved harvest areas since that is where we know that water quality is good. You can also see all of our water quality stations in yellow. We have over 80 stations in Apalachicola Bay. We also just recently uploaded all of our water quality data to the website that you can download and these files will be uploaded or updated every six months. So back to Apalachicola Bay, we were getting a lot of public interest in potential for aquaculture in Appalach. So we were working with a stakeholder group to help pick this area and to minimize any conflict with other uses for Apalachicola Bay's first AUZ. And AUZ is beneficial so we don't have a bunch of leases scattered all around. Uh, making it hard for navigation, and other recreational commercial uses, and they can have a little bit of safety in numbers, and it can be cheaper for their survey and markers. So the new AUZ is in yellow up here. We're calling it four mile, as is it about four miles from town, and the miles is historically known as this whole kind of northwest section of, of uh, St. Vincent Sound. If you're local, you've probably heard of the two mile channel and then there's eight mile and 10 mile roads up C30. There's also Green Point that kind of juts out that's just to the east of the AUZ. So it's gonna be 38 parcels, one and a half acres each. They've all been claimed, but we are still working through the paperwork executing the last few leaseholders. They will all be growing oysters in floating cages or suspended systems in the upper water column. This map shows all the leases currently in Apalachicola Bay. The seven red areas are the in perpetuity leases and our bottom cultured leases. These were grandfathered in and established before NOAA designated 14 areas around the Gulf as critical Gulf sturgeon habitat in 2003, Apalachicola Bay being one of those designated areas. So any new leases going in Apalachicola Bay will be water column leases. No bottom leases will be added. The first lease to go in was this one over here by Highway 65, you can see by this little green flag. Then a few parcels were added uh, over in the nine mile vicinity over here, which is when we started to see a huge increase in public interest for Apalachicola Bay and decided an AUZ would be beneficial. So for the new water column leases, we have the one over in Highway 65. We have five individual leases at nine mile five individual leases over in Rattlesnake Cove behind the state park, and then the 38 new parcels at Four Mile, making 49 new water column leases in Apalachicola Bay. Another new and exciting update for statewide leases is we just got approval for two experimental seaweed water column parcels over offshore Sarasota. Uh, Woods Hole and with the Department of Energy, they're working to see what potential native species we can grow here. 
They will be utilizing a vertical line system seen here. This will be a two-year project, which they received a special letter of permission from the Army Corps. We're also working diligently with the Army Corps of Engineers to modify our current general permit to include these other specific gear types and other marine species in hopes seaweed or macroalgae can be grown long-term through our Sovereign Submerged Lands Program in the future as well in state waters. In conjunction with the modification of that general permit, or also known as our SJJ-99, we're also including language for scallop gear along with that seaweed gear for potential new and exciting leasing opportunities with that as well. Uh, these two net types over here on the right, uh, you can see they're, and they're known as pearl or lantern nets and can also be done on a vertical line system. We've also just acquired a new Seismex flow cytometer, which is a ploidy analyzer. This machine can identify whether an oyster is a triploid or a diploid and can help with any potential theft issues. Unfortunately, we have seen in the past where harvesters have stolen aquaculture product off of a lease and tried to pass it off as wild product. Most farmers prefer a triploid oyster since they are sterile. They can expend all their energy into growing bigger or faster. This picture on the bottom shows some triploid oysters where you can see this nice defined streak on the shell, but not all triploids have this, this nicely defined. And usually you cannot tell the difference between a triploid and a diploid just by looking at it. So this machine will be really helpful for that. The last update I have for you today is we have been seeing a big interest in restoration aquaculture as well. So we are currently modifying our 1821 rule to allow restoration activities via a management agreement. This type of aquaculture lease is meant for non-commercial activities such as already allowed research and or education. This rule change will allow nonprofits to obtain a long-term restoration lease and utilize aquaculture gear, such as clam cover nets and bags to grow native bivalves and plants to a reproductive size. The rule doesn't cover the creation of artificial reefs or planting of substrate. The goal is to create high density spawning beds, which can increase populations in imperiled estuaries. For example, hatchery production of adults with enhanced survivability, such as high salinities or temperature tolerances. And with that, aquaculture is rapidly growing industry locally and around the state, has lots of economic and environmental benefits, and we're excited for the future of aquaculture. All right, thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you. Um, I do have a question from the chat. Um, have you noticed any problems with marine life hazards in farming operations? Marine hazards? Uh, yes, um, any marine life hazards. Oh, um, no, not that, that I've seen. Okay, great. Um, and uh, what's the website um, where you can get the water quality data? Uh, you can just go to our main page, fdax.gov and click on divisions or uh, and offices and then aquaculture. Okay, great. Uh, I'm not seeing anything else, so I can turn it over to Jenna. Yeah, I just wanna make sure there weren't any uh, hands raised. Looks like we're, we're good. Thank you so much, Carrie. Appreciate the overview and I, mean, um, I, I get excited about the new technologies uh, within aquaculture, but also the opportunities for um, aquaculture use and, and restoration. Um, very, very interesting. Our next speaker is Matt Davis from FWC. And uh, Matt will be giving us an overview of oyster monitoring in Apalachicola Bay. Hey, Matt, I see you. Oh, yes. Yep, yeah, Kennedy's got one. you. All right, take it away, Matt. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jenna. Appreciate you guys putting this on. Um, a lot of hard work going into this, trying to herd herd cats and uh, jump over a lot of technological barriers. Uh, appreciate your guys' uh, efforts. Um, like Jenna said, my name is Matt Davis. I'm the lab manager for FWC's oyster program in Apalachicola Bay. Our group has been carrying out oyster monitoring in the bay since 2015. And today I'd like to share with you uh, where our monitoring is occurring, what kind of monitoring we're doing, and some of the results we've seen over the past six years. There we go. So our monitoring occurs throughout the bay 
on historic oyster reefs. We have 15 stations spread out across the bay, and the bay itself is divided into three sections, with each section having five stations. These sections correspond to a management's harvest areas, with the winter sections having been open in the winter, and the summer section having been open in the summer. These sections also correspond to regions in the bay that have different hydrologic conditions. The oyster bars, like uh, Carrie was mentioning over in the miles, uh, on the west side of the bay look different and are affected by river flow differently than platform bar on the east side of the bay. Today I'm going to focus on two of our monitoring activities, our recruitment monitoring, which we do on a monthly basis, and our adult surveys, which happen twice a year. At each of our stations, we deploy three sets of recruitment T-bars. Each T-bar has two strings of oyster shells that are suspended off the bottom. They are left out for a month at a time, after which we swap them out with fresh stringers and bring them back to the lab. The idea is that as these shells are deployed, they provide hard substrate for the spat to settle on. We can then estimate relative recruitment rates for each month. Once at the lab, we count how many spat have settled on each shell. So what are the patterns we've been seeing over the past six years? This graph shows the relative monthly recruitment rate for all of Apalachicola Bay. The x-axis is showing the dates from the beginning of 2015, when we began monitoring, to the end of 2020, the end of uh, the data set that I have right now. Uh, the y-axis shows the recruitment rate in numbers of spat per shell. The first pattern we see is that the bulk of recruitment occurs between spring and fall. Oysters use temperature as one of the main cues for spawning, and typically, spawn when water temperatures are warm. Thus, it's not very surprising that our, uh, we have a lot of spawning during warm months. Uh, in our area, the largest peak is usually in the fall, but sometimes, like in 2017, the largest peak occurs in the spring. It's important to know when these recruitment uh, peaks are occurring, res restoration projects. Ideally, restoration efforts that involve adding culture substrate will want to put material out just before one of these peaks. If it's put out too late, larvae don't have the new material to settle on. But if we put it out too early, other competitors like barnacle, barnals, barnacles or mussels could settle on the material before the oyster spat get the chance. Another trend you may have already noticed is that the overall recruitment rates have been on the decline over the past six years. The differences between 2015's peak rates and those of 2020 are hard to miss. The trend of decreasing recruitment rates is evident when we look at each section of the bay separately. This graph is like the last, except that we are now looking at the annual recruitment rate for each of the three sections of the bay. Once again, we see that the rates have been on the decrease over the past few years. You may also notice that the recruitment rates aren't the same across the bay. Rates have tended to be highest in the east section of the bay and lowest in the west. Keep this in mind as we look at the survey results next. So the second monitoring activity I'd like to discuss is our oyster surveys. And like recruitment monitoring, these are done at those same 15 stations throughout the bay. However, unlike recruitment monitoring, we only do these surveys twice a year. Historically, these surveys were conducted before and after each commercial season opened and closed, which means they are usually completed over the course of about two months in the spring and in the fall. Each station is subtitled, which means that all our surveys are done by scuba diving. The image in the upper right is where we can see what we can see on a clear day. A diver will take a quarter of a meter squared quadrat down and collect the surface layer of whatever is in the quadrat placing all the material in a catch bag like the one picture. Using a new bag each time, they repeat that until we've collected 15 quadrats from each station. The diver then comes back to the boat and the samples are processed on board and put back in the water as they are finished. So what are we looking for in these quadrats? Well, we weigh each sample, measure the shell heights of the oysters we find, count all the live and recently dead oysters, as well as any oyster drills that we find. There we go. So what do the average densities look like in the past six years? 
The graph here shows the average oyster density for each section of the bay for each of the spring and fall surveys. We see a familiar pattern once again. Densities tend to be higher in the summer and east sections of the bay, just like we saw with recruitment. The overall decline in oyster densities isn't as easy to see, but comparing 2015 and 2016 to 2019 and 2020, reduction is much more evident. I would also like to note that what looks like a giant population explosion in the east section between fall of 2016 and spring of 2017. We saw a nearly seven-fold increase in our densities. However, this was due to the early recruitment peak that we saw back in, in 2017. It occurred just before that survey, so we saw a big jump in numbers, but the vast majority of those were spat, many of which don't survive to the next year. Now, it's not only the overall number of oysters which have been declining. This chart shows the average density of oysters, but this time it's only legal sized oysters. That is oysters larger than three inches. Again, we see the same pattern. Numbers are higher in the summer in these sections of the bay, and there's been a decline over the past six years. In fact, in 2019 and 2020, we had surveys in which we found no legal sized oysters. In 2020, we have an asterisk in the spring. We didn't complete the summer bar surveys due to COVID-19 restrictions. But the reason the west and east surveys don't show up for that same season is because we didn't find any legal oysters on those bars. Now, to put these numbers in a bit more perspective, the FDAXA guidelines before the fishery crash stated that an area needed 400 or more bags per acre to be a sustainable reef. That translates to 22 legal oysters per square meter. The highest numbers which we saw back in 2016 was less than three. That's one seventh of what a sustainable reef needs. So what is going on? Well, it's not just one thing. The entire bay has seen decreased river flows and increased salinity for the past 15 years now. This higher salinity has made a good environment for predators, shell pests, and disease. After the Federal Fisheries Disaster Declaration in 2012, the bay remained open to fishing until mid-2020. Every oyster landed during that time was one less oyster to contribute spat for the next generation and provided one less location for those spat to attach. If oysters die and no new spat settle on them, areas are areas that are at risk of being covered by sediment or being broken down by natural processes. All of this has led to a negative feedback loop where there are fewer spawning adults, which result in decreased recruitment, which leads to fewer adults and less habitat available in the next year. Now, this all sounds pretty gloom and doom, but is there still hope for the oysters in Apalachicola? Well, the next five years represent the best hope for restoration of the oyster habitat and the related fishery. There are a few things that will be happening over that time that give me hope that all is not yet lost. First, FWC closed the harvest of all wild oysters from August 2020 until December of 2025. We can't control the salinity in the bay and the resulting effects of predators, pests, and disease, but we can remove fishing pressure from the equation. And with numbers as low as they are, every little bit helps. Secondly, FWC will be leading a $20 million restoration project to place culch on up to 1,000 acres in the bay. Hopefully, this culching project will help jumpstart the population out of the negative feedback loop we've been in for the last decade. We'll be hearing more about this project from Jim Estes after the break. And lastly, FWC will continue our oyster monitoring to make the restoration effort more adaptive and hopefully more successful. That monitoring will also help the fishery be more adaptive as well once it is reopened. So in conclusion, we have a lot going on in Apalachicola Bay. We're monitoring recruitment rates, oyster population numbers, and more with our recruitment monitoring and oyster surveys. Both the recruitment rates and oyster numbers have been declining for the past six years, but with the fishery closure and the large-scale NIFWIF restoration project, we still have a chance of saving this historic system. So I'd like to 
thank you guys for listening and especially to my hardworking field staff. A lot of a lot of hours went into doing these surveys and working samples up in the lab. Uh, and I appreciate their hard work. And if we have any time left, I can take questions. Yeah, we are. That, um, we're a little bit up on time, um, so that's great. Uh, I'm not seeing anything right away, but give it a minute or two if anybody has anything to put in the chat. Um, okay, Matt Chase just came up with one. Uh, is Florida considering having a suite of oyster sanctuaries in the area? Uh, will, uh, excuse me, a suite of oyster sanctuary areas. Will harvesting be restricted? in the future to go along with restoration efforts? Well, right right now, the, the entire uh, wild harvest is closed for the next five, up to five years. Um, during that time, part of the NIFWF uh, phase two project will include looking at uh, different uh, techniques and tools when the fishery reopens um, and I'm sure that you know permanently closed areas will probably uh, be an option. Uh, hopefully, in five years, we'll have a better answer for you. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, do you know of anywhere else in the state of Florida that is uh, closing to wild harvest? Um, not at the moment. I, really, the Suwanee area is the only other that uh, does a lot of wild harvest um, so they're they're still open um, and most of the other areas don't have a an oyster population high enough to really support uh, commercial fishing okay great thank you for that answer um anything else guys oh, not seeing um okay beth right guys one uh, are there prior examples of moratoria working to restore shellfish populations? Um, that's a good question that I'll probably push off to Jim Estes um, next, um, as he is our, uh, one of the fisheries managers. I am just a lowly biologist, <laughs> so some of those decisions are beyond my pay scale. Okay. Um, are there oyster varieties that are more salt tolerant? Um, well, the only species that we have is Cressa, Cressostria virginica. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be, well, again, I don't, I don't think that there's going to be a push to um, use seed, uh, what, what they call seed oysters um, in part of the restoration. That might be um, something that's necessary. Generally, uh, Apalachicola Bay is considered to be not spat limited. Um, whether or not that's still the case is uh, yet to, to be known. Uh, I think we'll know that here in a couple of years, once we start putting down some cult material, um, our monitoring efforts will continue and we'll be able to see, you know, if we need to supplement uh, some of that with hatchery raised oysters. But right now that's that's not the that's not the goal or the uh, the main technique at the moment. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, that is looking like what we got. Thank you so much for your answers, Matt. I'll turn it over to Jen. Thank you very much, Matt. And um, I was thinking that maybe we could bring up these questions again during the next session. Um, I'm sure uh, Sandra or Jim would be happy to maybe provide some additional information uh, after they give their presentations. And uh, so I believe we're at break and um, we're planning to start the next session uh, at 2.35. Uh, so we'll go ahead and let everyone have a, a 20 minute break and get recharged for the, the uh, final session of the day. 
which will be on the Apalachicola Bay System Initiative, uh, the FWC-led oyster restoration. And uh, we'll also have uh, Dr. Ed Camp give a, a, a presentation as part of the, the ABSI group and uh, his work on uh, preventing further erosion of oyster-based ecosystem services. Uh, so we got some good stuff coming this afternoon. Please join us in about 20 minutes and we'll we'll get going again. Thank you. Okay, while we're waiting for everybody to come uh, come back, please remember to, to visit the, the Padlet, which the link is at the bottom of the slide here. You can interact with all of the speakers and we're gonna save um, those conversations, our questions, and we are recording the webinar. Um, our next session is going to be an, an overview of um, oyster restoration projects going on in Apalachicola Bay. And um, we will have three speakers. We're going to go ahead and let all of the speakers uh, speak for 15 minutes, and then we'll have questions at the end. So please either raise your hand or type your question in the question function. And um, First up, we have with us Dr. Sandra Brook, and she is the principal investigator on the Apalachicola Bay Systems Initiative, which is the, the Triumph funded uh, project uh, that's going to, that's looking at uh, how we can, the impacts of, of uh, the salinity in the bay and, and how we can restore the oysters. So, and then up next, we'll have Jim Estes and then Ed Camp. So, I'll give the con controls over to Sandra. That's a scary thought. Um, right, so thanks for the introduction, Anita. Uh, so I am, for my sins, the lead PI on the Apalachicola Bay System Initiative, or ABSI for short, since it's rather a mouthful. I'm going to give you the 35,000 foot view of this project. It's a five year multidisciplinary project uh, that has a number of components to them. Research is the underpinnings of the whole project, but I won't be going into it a lot uh, since uh, we don't have until breakfast time. So as it, as it says on this first slide here, our underlying goal or mission is to gain insight into the causes of the decline of the oyster um, or the Apalachicola ecosystem. Now, let me just back up a second and say that the ABSI sort of area is not just Apalachicola Bay, it's the entire coastline of Franklin County. So I include St. George Sound and Alligator Harbor as well. So, um, and particularly focusing on the deterioration of oyster populations. And then uh, the secondary, or the second components are to help develop a science-based management and restaurant restoration plan for the ABSI ecosystem. Uh, as Anita said, this was funded by Triumph Gulf Coast and also by Florida State University. So let's see if I can forward this. Okay, so ABSI comprises four primary components. The research, as I mentioned, is our underpinning, um, a restoration plan, a management plan, and then a crucial part um, is the community engagement. This is absolutely essential to the success of this project. And uh, even though it's last on the list here for aesthetic purposes, it is actually one of the more important components. Okay, so our research encompasses a number of different aspects of, um, well, research in this area, including anything to do with flows, hydrodynamics, water quality, nutrients, productivity, environmental conditions, and so forth. We know how important water flow, quality, salinity, and so forth is to the bay, so that's a big component of our project. Then there's the oysters, um, their physiology, predation, salt, uh, the effects of uh, the environment on them, mapping, recruitment and connectivity, fish communities and invertebrate communities, because this isn't just about oysters, it's about the ecosystem. And then the human induced pressures such as fishing pressure, climate change, sea level rise and so forth. Next. So all of these uh, research outcomes uh, go into decision support tools. Now, so I, I've heard a number of times that the Bay has been studied to death and why do we need more science? Well, we, there has been a lot of work done in the Bay, in this general area, uh, especially by Skip Livingston, you know, a couple of decades ago. But um, the difference I'm hoping between this work and your sort of standard academic approach is that 
our research will go directly into decision support tools that will assist management decisions. Thank you. So rather than, you know, under the normal scenario, academics come in, they do their work, and then they go away and publish. And sometimes it gets into the policy arena, and sometimes that work doesn't. This work is specifically designed to go into those decisions. So we're hoping it's going to be a little bit of a different approach than um, a lot of the other research that's been done in the Bay. And those um, decision support tools will feed into management options and restoration plans. So just to clarify here, obviously FSU is an academic institution. We have no right whatsoever to make management decisions. But what we can do is use our science to come up with some management options that might work under the given circumstances and to use our science to help guide large scale restoration plans. There has been a lot of restoration done in the Bay since 2013 when the fishery uh, crashed. But as you see from Matt's presentation, the oysters haven't come back and we need to understand why. So I'm going to talk about just a couple of our sort of primary research focuses, uh, the hydrodynamics uh, of the Bay. We've got two people working on this. One is Steve Lightman, who will be presenting later. Um, and he is working and has been working for a number of years on the watershed. Uh, the ACF watershed, which feeds into the bay itself, and he's looking at various scenarios of management and climate to assess how those change freshwater flows into the bay. And then we go over to Steve Murray, who is also presenting, I believe that's tomorrow, um, actually both of them tomorrow now. Um, Kennedy, I don't know if you can uh, hover over the top panel on the right there, and there should be an arrow that comes up. Yeah, if you just click that. So these two panels, um, they were created by Steve Murray, and what they do is they look at the salinity profiles in the bay under different flow regimes. So the top one is under high flow, and uh, the fresh is uh, blue and the salt is red. And so you can see that under high flow, uh, there's fresh water that uh, covers the entire bay, pretty much. And then, but as things change, then the salinity changes across the bay. Um, okay, if we go down to the bottom panel, Kennedy, I know this is a bit awkward, but uh, if you could move down to the bottom panel and do the same thing, yeah, they won't play at the same time, but that's okay. So this bottom panel is a low flow year. And the message here is, since we don't have time to watch the whole year go through, that, that a lot more of the bay stays high and salty, high salinity and salty for a lot longer under a low flow regime, which is intuitive but you can see which parts of the bay are still getting some of that you know, fresh water flow that the oysters need. Now, they're not necessarily badly impacted by salinity uh, uh, in terms of their own physiology, but in a high salinity situation, the marine predators come in and they can um, devastate the population. So this just shows visually the differences in what might be the sweet spots in the bay under different flow regimes. And this very simplistically is what the two hydrodynamicists are working on to identify the different climate and management scenarios on, and which areas in the bay might still be good for oyster survival given those salinities under those different scenarios, if that makes sense. Okay, next slide. And the hydrodynamic model will also be used uh, for larval dispersal uh, and connectivity estimations. So uh, intertidal habitats have not been studied very extensively in Apalachicola, in the Apalachicola area. Ray Grizzle has done some work um, using satellite mapping and ground truthing. But uh, when we first started this project, it was around the same time that um, FWC received their NIFWIF grant. And FWC, as Matt described, has already been monitoring subtidal areas. So we didn't want to you know, waste public funds by doing the same thing as, as an existing program. So we thought, well, we'll focus on the intertidal and then we'll find a way to share data later down the road. And so we we started working in the intertidal and, and doing it the old fashioned way. And I realized that we'd be doing you know, this with sticks and lasers until uh, I retired. So I decided to do it the easier way and use drones instead. And so this is the approach we're using. Um, we had the uh, entire intertidal area mapped using a drone and created digital elevation models. Those, um, those images are not terribly useful for assessing oyster densities. So we're coming down in height and getting higher resolution footage 
And those little funky little squares there are supposed to represent on the ground quadrats so that we can ground truth the, the drone data. I'm trying to do this quickly. I hope this makes sense and I'm not glossing over it too much, but I'll take questions later. So we are focusing on how the populations change over time within a year and through the years with um, in the intertidal area and with the with the view to understanding how much the intertidal actually contributes to the subtidal populations in terms of larval production and um, just general population density. So we're also um, are hoping to do some uh, subtidal mapping. Now mapping is um, very fundamental to trying to understand a system and anybody that's been out in Apalachicola Bay knows that it's not the Caribbean and you can't see the seafloor for 99% of the year. So we have to use technologies like sonar to um, get a sense of what's going on in the bottom. So the last time the bay was mapped was in 2006, at least thoroughly using sonar, was mapped in 2006 by Twitchell from USGS. And the top uh, left panel is a representation of that bathymetry. Uh, some of that bathymetry, well, that bathymetry is interpolated. It wasn't, um, they didn't map the entire area. They had swaths, which I believe were about 100 feet apart, and then they interpolated between them. FWC is sort of redoing this now um, using the same kind of approach. And so, again, rather than redo what they are doing, what we will do is identify some high priority areas that might be good for restoration or our research experiments and get high resolution sonar in those areas. And so I'm hoping that we can sort of trade data and uh, everybody can benefit. So again, FWC is doing their diving, their subtitle work using SCUBA. And they go to the same sites each time, which has value and there's definitely scientific reasons for doing that. So we thought, well, we can supplement that information by being a bit more um, broadcast and widespread and look at a number of different places and try and get more of a sense of what's going on in the entire bay, whereas FWC gets a more detailed information from those specific sites. And so we contribute data to each other. And so this um, map, which I know is hard to see um, on the small screen, but uh, essentially, if you look at the red parts of the pie, the pie itself represents how much material um, we found, um, and let me back up because I didn't tell you how we got this data. So we're going out with one of the local oystermen, Shannon Hartsfield, and uh, we're doing six tong grabs, three on either side of the boat. And these data, and we're looking at total uh, volume of material and then proportion of that material that is represented by live oysters, dead shell, and rock. So again, the size of the pie represents the amount of material, the live is red, the purple is rock, and the green is uh, shell. So you can see from this, the message is that in some parts of the bay, there's pretty much not very much going on, but there are some live oysters in um, parts of Cat Point, and then over by the miles and to the north of Dry Bar. So all is not lost. We are seeing some decent sized oysters in, in some parts, but there is a lot of area out there that really has nothing to speak of in the way of habitat. So we'll continue doing this work and um, uh, we'll uh, get a bit better picture of the bay as we go on. Okay, next slide. So another component of this project is the research hatchery and the research is uh, critical here. This is not for commercial enterprise at all. It's to condition spawn and set oysters for research purposes. We're going to be looking at, you know, environmental tolerances of the different life histories and, um, you know, just a number, a suite of different experiments and, and research objectives to do with uh, the oysters themselves. And we will also be setting oysters on a number of different uh, culture materials, such as the shell you see here. That's the classic example. This has been used to good effect up in the Chesapeake area where they are in a spat limited situation. They have been for a number of years. So this is what they started to do up there. As Matt said, you know, when we started this project, we were told this isn't necessary, we're not SPAT limited, um, but unfortunately it seems that we're sort of heading in that direction. So the point of these, uh, this part of the project is to see whether it's cost effective and useful to try and kickstart some of these populations. And of course, it goes without saying, we will be using local Apalachicola Bay oysters. We're not going to be transplanting oysters from elsewhere. Um, so we are doing a number of restoration experiments. And again, these are experiments. They are not full scale restoration. They are small scale. The idea is that we can 
test in a number of different materials, a number of different configurations, put them in a number of different places. And so rather than committing a huge amount of funds to you know, two or three particular places or you know, a big effort, we're going to try different things and see what works best in different parts of the bay. Now, I don't see our restoration here as a one-size-fits-all. We may want to try one approach for sanctuary reefs, for example, which are designed to create an entire ecosystem but are not tongable, they're not fishable, um, and versus other areas that may be open to commercial harvest. We haven't decided yet, and this is the point of the experiments, to try and get a better insight into what will work and where. I think I'm running out of time here. Um, and so that data will feed into the larger scale restoration plans like the NIFWIF project, which Jim will talk about next when I shut up. Um, so the, this, this data will feed into that. And this is how the projects are linked. Um, we are working together on uh, trying to understand what's going on and, and putting the bay on a pathway to recovery. So management strategies. This is uh, one of the objectives of our project, as I mentioned earlier, is to generate a number of potential management options. And none of these have been selected yet. We haven't even started this process yet um, in terms of trying to work through some of these management options. This is simply a list of things that has worked well in other areas. Some of these things have been tried in Apalachicola Bay. Many of them have not. Uh, but I think it's become apparent that we cannot carry on doing management the way it has been done um, and, and bring the bay back to any kind of sustainable uh, situation. So we're going to try, you know, look at some of these uh, management approaches. And this leads into the Community Advisory Board because all of this work will be done in collaboration with stakeholders, management agencies and law enforcement. As I said, we have no... Uh, jurisdiction to manage, so we are purely advisory and they can take or leave our advice as they choose. So the last component, and certainly not least, is the community engagement. We established, um, uh, we received our funding in the spring of 2019 and we established the community advisory board shortly after that. It consists of a number of stakeholders, you can see the representatives in the list on the right there. Um, we have a broad group of engaged stakeholders that have given us, they, they come with a, a, an enormous array of perspectives and everyone is valuable. I've learned an incredible amount of information from them and they are absolutely essential to this process. So um, we have been meeting with them. Uh, we started out bi-monthly, but then when COVID hit, we, we shortened the meetings to uh, half a day and we did it by Zoom and a half a day is quite enough Zoom for anybody, I think. So we've been working with them through the COVID and they've been troopers about it because it's not an easy thing to try and do. And we're making progress on coming up with, you know, our goals and um, our strategies. And we're just going to be moving into our management options um, come this, this spring. I must say, um, we're also having a specific Oysterman's workshops where uh, we, we do have two Oystermen on the cab, but we're bringing in the other Oystermen um, separately in separate workshops to talk to them about what they think about, you know, management, restoration, where we're going and, and just generally getting their feedback about what's happening in the Bay since they're going to be one of the biggest stakeholders in the success of this project or its failure. The other community engagement aspects we are going to be having, of course, some of these we haven't been able to do because of this virus, but uh, public workshops and open houses uh, we are hoping to have an internship program that we're, we'll sort of try it this year and see how it works. But the idea of that internship is that it's paid and it will increase the uh, workforce capacity in the aquaculture industry in this area. So we're not a commercial hatchery, as I said, but uh, we're hoping to teach people the nuts and bolts of, of the aquaculture industry. Um, and we have educational programs and volunteers as well. And I think Anita's about to shove me off the stage. So put the last slide up and uh, we can move on. Okay, well, we'll have questions shortly. Um, yeah. And next up is Jim Estes. He is with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. We're so happy to have him here. And he's gonna be talking about something Matt had mentioned, the, the um, money to do restoration in the Bay. So um, take it away, Jim. Um, Got it. You can hear me now. I, I present. <laughs> yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Jim Estes. For those that you don't that don't know me, I am the deputy director of the Division of Marine Fisheries Management 
for FWC. Um, I became involved in this project um, in 2012 when our executive director said, hey, there's something going on with Wishters, I think, in Apalachicola. Would you all mind going down there to a meeting? And that was the that was the beginning of it. There probably were a thousand people there because there had been some predictions that what has happened has happened, is going to happen. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly. I think mine will be fairly short. Um, where Sandra talked about the project per project from the 35,000 foot level, I'm going to be in the stratosphere. Um, but before I go through a few slides, I, there's some there's some takeaways that I wanted. I wrote down that I wanted to make sure that I say before we even start. And we've heard a little bit of about this from some of the other very good presentations, by the way, that we heard. And we heard the impact of we have changing conditions. Um, so we know that we have sea level rise. Um, we know that we have and are going to have um, periods of low flow. And so the expectation of this project that I'm going to talk about is not that we are going to make Apalachicola Bay like it was. There are some folks that want it to be like that, but it's not going to happen. And so I think there was a question earlier about um, uh, are we going to revise our harvest strategies? And um, Sandra kind of kind of hinted at it or said that we we are going we are going to have to. And the hard part for our manager is getting the public to or the fishermen to adapt to these future conditions. And so before we had kind of unlimiting harvesting, that's not going to happen in in the future. And the other important part, and we'll talk about this a little bit on the next slide also that I want to have a takeaway, that successful restoration here depends on collaboration. And so I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Um, to me, so what we have here is we have a situation where we have um, SPAT, which I believe, Matt, Matt kind of hinted at this, I believe it, it is at least limited by, um, spatially limited, um, we ha and Sandra mentioned that there are there is no substrate in much of the bay, and so we have to we have to work on making those two making those two things work. And let me get back to the collaboration first. First, let me talk about the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, they have committed a little over twenty million dollars to us, and it's a little bit unusual for me. It's a little bit unusual to me to work for a funding partner that wants to be so involved in the content, and this is a good thing. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Foundation, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, or NIFWF, they actually have um, subject matter experts that consult with us occasionally, and it's been very helpful because they can connect us to people in other parts of the country. And this, these logos here are just an example of some of the partnerships we had. We all probably forgot some, um, especially um, FSU with Sandra. In fact. I don't think that there's a week that goes by that Sandra and I don't talk on the phone. Um, we are going to be working more closely with Ed Camp, who you're going to hear from next from University of Florida. And obviously, the people of Franklin County are part of this whole thing. And so this grant and this, this commitment, um, we are supposed to have it finished in six years. Um, it includes the work that we're going to describe on Apalachicola Bay and a little bit of work on Swanee Sound because there's been some impacts there also. Okay, so um, in this project, we really have two main stages. We have the stage one here where we are going to collect data and Matt describes some of the work that they're doing. Um, we have a harvest management system. We're going to compile the information. We're going to all get together and share the data. And then we're going to make a decision where I'm going to go to NIFWF and I'm say, can we have our other $17 million because here's our plan. So the data collection portion of this is, and Sandra mentioned this already about the mapping. So we have contracted with the University of New Hampshire, and they have mapped some pretty good portion of the bay, more than they thought they could that they were going to be able to do. And they are now going through those data now. And then Matt talked about that we we're going to be evaluating oyster densities with our project, and Sandra is doing similar things on the intertidal oysters. We are looking at SPAT. We are also, Matt mentioned this, but we're also looking at sedimentation rate because what has happened is, is because we lost this, I would call it a, a carbonate glue matrix that kind of held these bars together, it's gone now. And we believe that we're having sedimentation has increased and things are moving around a little bit. 
And then Matt has also mentioned that we're looking at predatory snails. So in Swanee Sound, it's a much smaller project. We are looking at mapping and we're gonna do a one-time survey there. And that's probably all that I'll mention about Swanee Sound right now. And then somebody asked earlier, and I already said it, I think, but somebody asked, are you gonna allow the same uh, harvest that we did before? The answer is absolutely not. Um, we are gonna be working with um, the cab that Sandra mentioned. Um, we are also gonna be working with University of Florida with Ed Camp um, to do a stakeholder informed um, management system. And so for those of you that have not managed like I didn't used to, I started in research and was there for a long time. I thought we can just do what the science says and we can tell the people what to do. Well, it doesn't work like that. We have to, we have to get the folks on board and this is gonna be a little bit tough to do this. And I think that Ed is gonna talk about that also. Let me, let me go back to the harvest. Well, I'll, I'll do it at, at the end. And then what we got to do is we got to take all this information and, and Sandra only showed you some of the stuff that they're doing and we're doing some experiments of our own. We need to take all that information together and we need to share the information. We need to get all these smart folks in a room and we need to evaluate it. And so again, the three things that we need to answer because I'm a simple minded person is where do we put the material to culch? What kind of materials and what size of materials to use? There's been everything from lime rock to fossilized oyster shells to oyster shells to clam shells that have been used in the past. And so we got to figure not only what the material is, but what size it is. Um, and then we got to figure out how high to pile it. So we do know that some of these bars have been degraded down and they're probably are not going to be able to catch oyster spat like they used to in the past. And so we're going to get all this stuff together in what I'm calling here is a data workshop. It's not like a assessment workshop, but it's everybody, we're gonna spend probably a week or so putting things together and writing things up. And then we're gonna make a recommendation. And then I'm gonna to go to um, NIFWIF and we're gonna discuss about what, what we wanna do and why we wanna do it. And then stage two, as long as we can find some agreement with NIFWIF, they'll release the $17 million, and again, it's a simple thing, but it's difficult to determine where we're we gonna do this, what are the materials gonna be, and how high do we need to pilot? And then of course, as Matt mentioned, we're gonna continue monitoring. In fact, we have state funding actually to continue after the, after the six year project. So here's the, here's the timeline. So we're still in the data collection and mapping, we finished the mapping. We're a little bit behind because of COVID. Um, as soon as um, Ed Camp and I can get our administrators to actually sign a piece of paper, which has taken a year to get done, uh, we will. he'll be working with this stakeholder and form harvest management plan. And then we're gonna go through the, uh, um, make the decision about what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. And then we're gonna go do it. So. We are kind of in a hurry. And the reason that we're kind of in a hurry, several reasons, but so we suspended harvest, as you saw earlier, Matt, I think mentioned it. We've suspended all harvest of oysters until December of 2015. And we have a commitment to open, to have some kind of an opening of a, some kind of a fishery by then. We have a rule that says that our the rule will go away, in fact. And the public is very mistrustful that we're ever gonna open it. And so we need to be getting this stuff done quickly so that we can keep our word. And I think that's all I have. Great, Jim, thank you. And next up we have Ed Camp from the University of Florida. And he's gonna talk about preventing further erosion of the oyster-based ecosystem services. Hi. There he is. Hi, take it away. Okay. Um... So thank you guys for having me here. A special thanks to Jenna and the rest of the staff for organizing the symposium and allowing me to come and talk at it. And the talk that I'm going to be giving today has really two purposes, the first of which is to sort of explain um, my perspective on how serious the situation with oysters is here. And the second is to briefly describe one of the tools that Jim mentioned that we're trying to develop to support management decisions that will help us curb the loss of ecosystem services provided by oysters. 
Great. So the talk is in two parts, the first of which is going to be um, my assessment of the situation sort of from a macro level, looking at oyster ecology to ecosystem services to fisheries to management decisions. And then the second is going to be a brief description of this model. And I'm sure some of you have seen parts of this before. Uh, hopefully it is useful to see it put together. So everyone recognizes that oysters are important as an animal as well as a habitat and as both they provide a series of benefits to humans that we like to call ecosystem services. So oysters, the animal, do us a service by filtering water and removing excess nutrients that in too high quantities can lead to deterioration of aquatic ecosystems, um, hindering the services that those ecosystems provide us as well. But oysters, the animal, also form these large reefs and these reefs constitute substantial, in many cases considered essential fish habitat to myriad, uh, sorry, to myriad organisms, fish and birds and crustaceans. And these animals are useful from both a recreational and commercial perspective as well, just from an ecosystem perspective. But the habitat is also used by oysters itself and that's given their nature to recruit on the live or fresh dead shell of oysters. And that basically means that the juvenile spat settles and then grows um, from the sizes where they're probably most vulnerable to predation to larger sizes uh, on this shell. And that's incredibly important because what it means is in concert with providing this literal substrate for the oysters to land on and to grow on, the reefs as they grow up act to affect the entire environment, having in fresh water, uh, continuing or creating an ecosystem environment that facilitates the survival of oysters themselves, and as well as a whole lot of other organisms. So these oyster reefs protect salt marsh grass, they can have positive effects on mangroves or seagrass, and ultimately they provide shoreline stability that's incredibly valuable to humans. So the, the main idea here is that oysters are effectively these autogenic ecosystem engineers is how they've been described as, as animals that create a habitat that is incredibly useful to them as well as to other creatures. That's the ecosystem engineer part. The potential weakness of the oyster is that it is considered good to eat and good enough to eat that people spend substantial money buying it. The, you know, the, the point is that um, oyster harvesting has been going on in a long time in Florida and in other places. And the primary issue with this, or one of the primary issues with this, is that the harvesting doesn't just remove oysters, the animal, they remove oysters, the habitat. So we have all these historic black and white photos of, you know, um, figurative mountains of oyster shell that's been removed, whether that's Apalachicola or other parts around the country. Despite all of this, for generations, oysters have been a part of the coastal community and supported, and in some cases, continue to support um, some of these, these smaller coastal communities, especially throughout Florida. But obviously, all is not well, especially in Apalachicola Bay, and note that this is from 2012, so this is not a new collapse, and it's also not limited to Apalachicola Bay. So many of you are familiar with this Beck et al. paper suggesting that Actually, most of the oyster reefs that we have any historical record about are either functionally extinct or severely um, diminished around the world. And so that leads to a, a question of why this is. If we understand oysters are so valuable to humans, and they're actually one of the more visible resources, this isn't some deep sea fish that we can just never see how many are out there, why is it that consistently we seem to do not a good job of not crashing their populations of not depleting them. And so what I'm going to suggest here are um, a few reasons that I would believe may be affecting this and have implications for what we do next specifically in Apalachicola. The first one of these things that I would suggest is that oyster recruitment dynamics are very likely depensatory. What I mean by that is as opposed to um, compensatory. And so for those with fisheries background or those without, this is a basic stock recruit relationship. It shows the relationship between the amount of adults on the x-axis here and the amount of surviving juveniles on the y-axis. And the primary, um, th th this is the single reason why any fishery can be sustainable, that as your adult abundance decreases, such with fishing, the juvenile survival rate increases. So you get compensating juvenile survival at decreasing adult abundances. This is why we can really overfish something like red grouper or snapper or a gag and have the population come back. And the critical thing about this is that those animals don't 
recruit on the dead bodies of their uh, adults. And that's the difference with oysters. So if we have something that creates its own habitat, and specifically here we assume that the habitat suitable for recruitment actually depends on the amount of shell that's still in the water, then we have a really different curve that emerges. And it suggests that the survival increases at decreasing adult abundance up to a point. And then there's some threshold beneath which the juvenile survival rate actually decreases with declining adult abundance. And what that, the reason that is happening is because once you get not enough habitat, there's not enough spaces for the oysters spat to land and settle on. And so there are fewer recruits, which means there's fewer adults, which means there's even less shell available for the future generations and it spirals down to collapse. You know, another way of saying this is that unlike most, but not all the animals that humans have harvested, perhaps oysters have really not evolved to become rare. That alone is not likely the reason. Uh, it would also be coupled with a couple aspects of the way we manage oysters. And one of them is reactive management. And that simply means that we wait until there's a problem to take further action. Now, generally, that is a really, really good thing. We want management to be reactive. If management was proactive, it's almost certain that we would leave a lot of, uh, leave a lot of money on the table, basically deprive people of the economic opportunity and of the harvest yield. The challenge is that's true with compensatory animals, but if you have a depensatory situation and you don't have an early enough warning that you're getting close to this, uh, this inflection point, this threshold, then by the time uh, the management is able to react, it may be too late to prevent really a shift to a, a bad alternative state. So why is it that management doesn't have more of a warning? And this comes back to the fisheries scientists like myself, and that is fisheries assessments, stock assessments are at their nature retrospective. What that means is that the nature of the stock assessment is to look at data and ask the question, based off these removals in the past, how did the stock do? If we remove this many oysters in the past, what was the recruitment going forward? And that works reasonably well, again, as long as you have that compensatory function, not depensation. If you have depensation, so if you actually have a situation like in an oyster and you don't realize it, what you will wind up doing is saying, well, we removed for decades or perhaps even a century, lots and lots of oysters and everything was fine until it suddenly isn't. So when you couple these things together, if the ecology is in fact depensatory in the recruitment dynamics, which a number of papers have now suggested, the management we believe is, is fair to characterize it as reactive and that's not a knock, that's just the way it really should be. And you couple that with retrospective assessments, all that's needed is a market situation where the price of oysters means that the removal of shell outpaces the creation. And then it is simply mathematically and tautologically just a function of time and productivity. More productive systems with less efficient gear, like where you have um, said that we can't do dredging, will take longer times to collapse. And I suspect that's what we've seen in places like Apalachicola Bay, where less productive systems where there is dredging, like what you see on the, the east coast of Australia, were collapsed within you know, a couple decades very quickly. And that was over 100 years ago. So the problem facing managers in Florida is how do we sustain or recover these ecosystem services while allowing for some fishery and economy? Um, understanding that some resources have perhaps already collapsed, however that's defined, and that we think others may be closed, but we really don't know for sure because, you know, in fairness, this depensatory relationship that I'm suggesting here is not not hard and fast proven. It has been suggested there's evidence to support it, but even if it's true, we're not exactly sure what that curve looks like and where that, where that threshold point is. So the real challenge is how do we make decisions about restoration and management, which as Jim said, they need to be made right now with a lot of uncertainty and, and what tools can we try to bring to the table to help those decisions be made. And that brings the second part of the talk, which is just a brief description of a simulation model that I've developed here for oysters that allows us to, to look at some of the things that I've just said. 
Um, and so the disclaimer here is that this is not fit to data yet. So this is not prescriptive of Apalachicola Bay. It is a simulation model. I think there's still some useful things we can glean from it. Um, and to start off with, let's look at the simple case if oysters behaved like fish, where you have you know, eggs that simply turn into recruits that turn into harvestable adults that produce eggs. And basic fisheries population dynamics should hold that the, the population would be in equilibrium absent fishing and stochasticity. And then if you begin a very substantial fishery, you will greatly diminish your amount of harvestable adults and your eggs. But because of that um, compensatory recruitment survival, recruits will go down, but not by that much, and the population will not collapse. And, and further, if you simply back off on the fishing effort a little bit, as signified where this, this dashed line is here, you will see rebounds in eggs, the harvestable adults and recruits. That's if oysters were fish. That's what we would expect to see. It's what we see in red snapper and red drum and gag. Um, but we don't believe that's how oysters function. We think the oysters' eggs must need to settle on shell upon which they recruit and turn into harvestable adults that not only produces eggs, but also when those adults die of natural causes, produce more shell. So when we change the math of the model to reflect that, obviously the equilibrium, we would still have an equilibrium. Um, but then with fishing, this is the fascinating thing to see, that at first it looks just like the other figures, um, the eggs and the harvestable adults and the recruits fall and they appear to stabilize. There's been no increase in effort though before the second fall. What happens is that the shell is slowly ticking down and down and down until it hits that threshold and then when the shell goes away, you see your recruitment falling and everything else effectively collapses. This is an alternative stable state, um, a catastrophic or fold catastrophe, however you want to say it, um, but, but that's what's going on. So we can play around with this type of model and we can say, well, okay, let's back off on effort. And what you see is, yeah, there's, there's some relief, but it's very slight. Because it's these alternative stable states, because you've fallen into this, this low productivity state, it's really difficult to get back to that area where there's lots of recruits, where there's uh, you know, lots of harvestable adults. And so even if you say, well, don't just back off the effort, actually shut the effort down for a period of you know, maybe, um, in, in this case, I think about seven years, and you actually put some shell in here. So this little green line here is where we added some shell. Um, it doesn't completely bring it back, and, and this gets into some of the dynamics that we're not certain on, but they show what could happen, which is that you put shell in and shell decays. Shell eventually breaks down and becomes less useful for recruitment. And if the fishery isn't closed for long enough, there actually hasn't been enough time to get enough spat in the water to settle on that shell and start the process up to push it over that hump to get back to the high productivity state. And so even with a fishery shutdown and with a substantial addition of restoration, if that material doesn't persist, the fishery winds up barely better than it was before, which is pretty sobering given what we're talking about here. Now, you can push it back. Again, this is not prescriptive, but this is just to illustrate a much longer fishery shutdown of about 12 or 13 years and a much greater addition of shell. And again, please understand this is not prescriptive. This has not been fit to Apalachicola. The number of years, the amount of shell, these are theoretical. The point is you can transfer back to this high productivity state if you give enough relief from fishing effort and if you make enough of an addition to the habitat. But that's the, the really challenging aspect for us here is trying to figure out how long does it need to be shut down for, how much material needs to be added, and what type of material is likely to be resilient or robust enough to, uh, to get us back over this hump, understanding that there's certainly costs of having fisheries shut down longer and that material has actual cost of implementing as well. So how I'm hoping that this model can be used is once it's fit to data as reasonably well as we can, once we're satisfied with it, what we want to do is to play different scenarios, not just about what management does, but how the environment may or may not change, and try to find management actions that are robust to as much uncertainty as we can handle in how the system works and what happens in the future. And I'm hopeful that that will at least give us some guidelines on how we should view the not just recovery of the fishery, but the recovery of the oyster population and the ecosystem services that it provides.
So if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Ed. Uh, Josh, do we have questions? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, is Sandra still on? We have yeah. one for her. Okay, um, you had the slide with the animated salinity in the bay. Um, where uh, did that data Kennedy come from? Kennedy does. <laughs> oh yeah, I think Kennedy can probably put it back up for us. But um, do you remember where you got that the data for? Oh the, uh, yes, it's on? actually um, Steve Moray, our hydrodynamicist. Um, I requested that he put together something like this just so I could sort of explain to people what the objective of our project was. And so it's actually available on the um, AFC website. You can go on to the Appalachia Color Bay System Initiative, FSU. It's um, There's a website that we put together just for this project. And if you go under research, dig around a bit, I can I can provide the link if, if people would would like but yes it's available you can you can play around with it and look at it yeah if you could put that in the chat that would be very helpful oh, sure. in the questions yeah that would be great sandra if you put it in the questions then everybody could see it i shall see what i can do great thank you all right any more questions anybody putting up hands checking the padlet right now um well, Renee had another comment for Sandra. Just wanted to say I really like your community advisory group and how you're approaching the whole project. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. And um, Ed, outside of influences, flows, slew restoration, your thoughts, how can we influence? Oh, lost you there. Okay, that's that's the end of what we got from Chadwick. Um, so, influences, flows, slew restoration, your thoughts, how can we influence what's happening? I'm sorry, I missed the end of it, but I think you're asking for, are you asking? Yeah, I'm for kind of taking help? my best guess. This is this is a, a, an oddly phrased uh, question in the question box here. Um, okay. So, it just says, outside, well, at outside of influences, flows, slew restoration, your thoughts, how can we influence? I suspect that the most potent knobs we have to turn are the amount of time that the fishery is closed for, how well that is enforced, and the material that is used for substrate. Um, it seems from talking to the other professionals, some of whom have prevented, presented here and others um, have not, that we will have less control over the amount of water entering the bay because we don't control the climate directly. Um, and so because of that, I, I think that at least it is our responsibility to act as if the things we can control the most will have to do with the harvesting and the restoration. Um, there's certainly aspects that we know we can't control, but our job is to try to figure out how do we manage a system for its best ecosystem services and provision of what people need it for given uncertainty that we can't overcome? Great. Um, and uh, what kind of materials are on the ballot for substrate restoration in the Bay? I think Jim mentioned this, but I'm comfortable just paraphrasing what he said, which is that a lot of things are being considered now from fossilized oyster shell to rock of various uh, natures, mostly limestone, but also there has been discussion of other rock types and of various sizes, as well as things like um, clamshell. Um, I think based off this, the little simple figures that I showed you, what we would most want is a substrate that is not likely to decay in its utility as a recruitment substrate. So that requires some experimentation and it may require some alterations of what we think of as the most useful substrates for restoration. Okay. Um, and this is directed to anyone. Um, uh, has anyone ever tried to implement something like a shell return deposit, similar to what was done to aluminum cans, try to ensure a more directed recycling of the shell? 
Yeah, that has been done in a number of places uh, with varying success. I think it's reasonable to assume that you will never get back as much shell as you take out, but it is certainly a way to slow the deficit. It will be more challenging the more your fishery is for the half shell market and the less your fishery is for shucking. Um, for anyone on the panel, oh, Sandra, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to mention that, you know, back in, in the 90s, I think it was the late 90s, until then, there was a, a line item in the in the state budget that um, helped recycle some of the shell that was deposited through the shucking process at the fish houses um, and put it back in the bay. And that was so, you know, replenishing some of the habitat as as it was removed, essentially, rather than taking it away to nothing and then having this big problem and having to replace a lot of material. And that that uh, uh, funding went away in the late 90s. And so I think after that sort of reshelling and habitat restoration was sporadic at best until um, until the population diminished. But Jim could probably speak to that better than I can. I think that's that's that that is accurate. But I think our goal would be our goal would be if we could adaptively manage out here is that we wouldn't have this great deficit of shell, mm -hmm. that we would have the growth of the oysters would replace the deficit that is taken. That's the that's the holy grail. But it's very complicated to be to honestly do that. Sure. Um, since we're kind of talking about this, um, I got a question on the Padlet. Uh, is the rate of shell removal by harvest adequate to explain the loss of recruitment observed in recent years? Been hearing that harvest removal of shell is very rapid. Is shell removal alone adequate to explain the recent declines? I don't. I don't. I do not believe so. We've had environmental things that have happened too. So we have, you know, natural mortality of oysters that it looked like at least it, it looked like it, you know, increased greatly. Certainly, the removal of shell by the fishermen probably didn't help. But in recent years, they haven't removed much because there hasn't hardly been any fishing. So there's, it's not a simple answer, honestly. I largely agree with what Jim said. It's not, with the data that we have, I don't think it is possible to prove it, but it is consistent. The, the decrease in oysters, specifically the decrease in juvenile survival is consistent with a habitat structure that is much less beneficial to them and it is consistent with the type of fold catastrophe or alternative stable states that would be triggered by a gradual reduction of shell from fishing you could have these sudden shifts where everything looks fine that was the point of the simulation to illustrate that you could have these things lurking under the surface and not recognize them until it gets to the critical level and then it would look like the same type of harvest that had been sustainable for decades all of a sudden triggered a collapse. So I'm not saying that that's what happened because I don't know that and I can't prove that. And there very certainly were other things that would have, um, that may well have contributed to that as well. But it is consistent with the hypothesis that we've seen published now from a number of folks, including Mike Wilberg in the Chesapeake and some folks in California. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, everybody on the panel, um, have oyster diseases been a big problem contributing in the decline of the oyster populations of Apalachicola Bay? Sandra? So Matt actually is probably better equipped than I am to deal with this, but my understanding is that Dermo is, which is the primary disease in the bay as far as we know, is kind of endemic, or it is endemic. And it peaks in the summer when it's warmer, and then it declines in the winter. So it's been, Domo has been in the Gulf of Mexico, well, it was identified back in the 40s. My understanding is that it was actually Gulf of Mexico transplants to the Chesapeake, took it up there. So it's been with us for a very long time, and uh, we're monitoring the intertidal habitats, and FWC is monitoring the subtidal habitats for Domo. And I don't know what their disease profiles look like, but I haven't heard anyway that 
disease is responsible directly for these large mortalities. Now, I will say that when it's warmer and more saline, dermo is more prevalent. So you get peeps in the disease. But whether it's responsible for huge mortalities, I, I don't think that's terribly clear. I don't know if Andy Kane is on here, but Andy Kane has looked at this. He probably would be the one best to answer it. Andy Kane from the University of Florida. And he's speaking tomorrow, I believe. Okay, guys, thank you so much. I have uh, one more from Beth Wright. Uh, and this was asked before, but um, wanted to get your opinions on it. Are there prior examples of moratoria working to, uh, to restore shellfish populations? So in 1985, we had a hurricane come through Apalachicola Bay, and the fishery was shut down, I believe, for a year and a half or two years. Um, there was a little bit of shelling that happened, and the fishery became better. I don't know what it was. It became better because of the moratorium or if something else happened. There was a little bit of shelling that was done, habitat restoration that was done afterwards. So it's happened, but it's not. it's very uncommon as far as I know, at least here. Yeah, and to add on to that, the work that I've just, the simple things I've done here, but also work that's been done in the past um, by uh, Pine et al. in 2015, which I was part of, what that suggests is that a moratorium on harvest alone would be not expected to recover a fishery, at least on a time scale that would be socially acceptable if it is this type of thing where we have an alteration in the juvenile survival rate, whether that is driven by natural mortality from predators or disease or really anything else. That's one of the really important things here is that oysters have proven over and over again that at lower densities and compromised reef structures, they're susceptible to any number of proximate causes of death. But the work that's been done has suggested that if that's the case and you've transitioned to a sort of low survival state for your smaller oysters, a fishery moratorium on its own would not be expected to bring it back on any reasonable time scale. Um, and that's why it's important. But, but, but what it can do, the lack of a moratorium can make it much harder to bring back, if that makes sense. Um, and so that's a that's little catch-22 that we're working with here. I don't think any of us expect that the moratorium alone can fix something. Um, but the concern is that the absence of it may make it much, much more difficult to bring back. And that's come forward even in some of the simple simulations that I've run. And, and so to follow up with that, if I could, so we've seen this, so this has happened. So we have at least one time when we've seen this happen. I believe that it has a lot to do with um, um, low river flows. We know we're gonna have climate change. And so these things are likely to happen again. And so we had to be very conservative when we open the fishery back up. And there are going to be a lot of people, like I said before, that are not going to understand this because they think that we should be able to put it back like it was in the past. But we're not going to put the earth back like it was in the past, at least not in the short term when Ed and Sandra and I are working on this. Great. Thank you. Um, and we have a question for Sandra. Uh, will APSI be looking for at freshwater inputs other than the Apalachicola River? A friend who has done uh, research at Tate's Hill suggesting that hydrologic alteration there is a problem. Uh, yes. So the ACF watershed is obviously the biggest influx into Apalachicola Bay. So, and we have somebody, you know, in, in Steve Lightman that's been doing it for a very long time. It's also a managed system. So we're looking at um, different ways that we might be able to approach the Army Corps, whether that will work or not, who knows. But, but yes, a lot of our focus is on the ACF, and that's why I mentioned it. But we're also um, looking at inflows through, the, through Tate's Hell, um, how much in the way of nutrients and, and fresh water that brings in, where that goes, that would be incorporated into the hydrodynamic model. And so the short answer is yes. But it's uh, the bigger focus is obviously on Appalachia, the Appalachia the River. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, that appears to be all the questions that we have, unless anybody has anything that they'd like to close with. 
Thank you. All Appreciate right, yeah. the question. All right, I'll turn it back over to Anita. Okay, well, thank I put you. Put that link in the uh, questions, by the way, the one that was requested to the models. Yes, yes, great. Thank you, Sandra. And um, yes, Ed, uh, um, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yes, it's up on the Padlet, um, and it's also in the in the question and answer. So um, everybody should be able to find it. Thank you so much. And please get involved. It's there's a, a lot of opportunity. There's there's minutes and newsletters that go out every month. So, but thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ed and Sandra and Jim. Great presentation. And um, we're going to wrap up just a few minutes early. Just to remind you, uh, I'd like to, well, first thank all of our speakers all day long and everybody for hanging in. It's It's been a long day. Uh, I don't blame anybody for being tired of, of sitting here. So uh, we're, we're so thankful you decided to join us. And I think it's been a wonderful day. Um, <clears throat> Tomorrow we'll get started at uh, nine o'clock, and you feel free to log in. We'll we'll have it open at about eight thirty, but you don't need to log in till nine, and we'll have another day full of of great science. So, once again, thank you everyone, and have a great evening.